Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody else, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face, they basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reach my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. 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 to the show everybody you're listening to the confessionals podcast i'm your host tony merkel thanks for being here if you have a crazy wild experience you want to share with me on the show go ahead and shoot me an email my email address is contact at the confessionals podcast.com that's contact at the confessionals podcast.com or go to the website the confessionals podcast.com hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well either way works for me just get a hold of me if you're listening to my voice right now, I got a sweet, sweet deal for you. Just sit back, relax, and have a good time today because we have a special guest coming on. We're not going to waste any time. We're going to get right into it. Uh, we have Bobo joining the show. Bobo, what's going on, man? Uh, not too much, man. I'm just enjoying the summer. Dude, uh, you're telling me. This is my first summer in Tennessee, and I am loving it here. Uh, the... The other day you called me and I was on the lawnmower and I was getting ready to mow the lawn. I think I had just started and you gave me a call and I, I stopped and we talked for like an hour and a half. And yeah. on that conversation, you, a couple of times you were like, when I was on your show and I was like, Bobo, you were never on my show. <laughs> 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 like, I think uh, our conversations kind of just get blended in. You think, oh, I was on that show. And it's like, nope, we just had conversations on the phone that sounded like podcasts, I guess. Yeah, that's that much difference for me. Right? The same here. I mean, <laughs> and that's that's actually the kind of goal I would say with what I do. I like having just conversations with people. And so uh if it, it if it sounds like you're listening to two people on a phone call, it's because that's it's meant to sound that way. I just want people to feel like they're sitting at a table and they're just listening to two people go back and forth about topics that people tend to enjoy. And you could, uh, could have saved some time if we just would have recorded our phone call. And you could have played that. <laughs> I'm saying, like, if I would have recorded the phone calls, I, I think we would have had like five episodes now, and they would have <laughs> been they would have just been complete heaters, and uh, yeah. people would have dug it. So, uh, but here we are on the first appearance on the Confessionals for you, and I hope it's not the last. Uh, before we get into any kind of conversation today, I need you to plug your podcast because. The people need to know where they could find some more Bobo. Oh, yeah. Our podcast is Bigfoot Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. And uh, if you ever need uh, someone to do a message like birthday wish or, you know, tell your boss that they're an idiot for not knowing about Bigfoot or anything like that, I can do personal customized video messages on the Cameo app. Just look up Bobo Bigfoot and I'm there. Perfect. Uh, people listening, I'm sure, you know, they know who Bobo is. Uh, and uh, if you if you don't, then I'll just tell you finding big for the TV show. He was on that. And uh, but I think most people listening, you know, they understand the TV show and all that stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll ask you this. And these are questions that maybe um, it just kind of jumpstart conversation. We'll just see where it goes. Uh, but you and I were just talking about some of the the your past life in a sense, Uh and and I I don't remember you ever telling me this, and maybe it's just public knowledge. And like, because you said to me, 
uh, that you tend not to really get involved in like the whole people of Bigfoot, but more the topic itself. And, um, and that's kind of how I am with a lot of this stuff as well. So I had no idea you were a crab fisherman for 19 years. Is that something that you were doing like straight out of high school? No, no, I didn't start that till I was like in my mid late twenties, I guess. Yeah. Like, uh, no early twenties. Yeah. Or mid twenties. And then, um, I mean, some years like the season would be over like in two weeks because there's just no crabs, you know, or some years we'd go for five months. Jeez. Um, yeah. And then, then I, in the summer I'd do shrimp or salmon and, uh, and then crab and the and it, crab was every winter I'd do crab. Wow. Wow. So, uh, it sounds like a rough, uh, job because, uh, I've seen the dead, what is it called? The deadliest catch. Uh-huh. And is it anything like that? Because that's terrifying to me. Yeah, but I mean, you know, there's they, they're, of course, they're going to show like the gnarliest stuff, which happens, but there's plenty of days where it's just kind of crappy. You know, it's like eight, nine foot seas and 25 knot winds. And, you know, it's not like ice building up everywhere and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, um, you go home to the family and you're like, yeah, today was a pretty boring day. And then the next day it's like, yeah, Billy almost died. So in those jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you definitely come close to making your, you, you come close to meeting your maker every once in a while for sure. And then, I mean, I got, you know, I had friends that died and stuff. I was on the one boat where one guy died. And really? Then I, a couple boats I fished on that I got off on. Uh, when, when I got off of them, like I, I just didn't, I thought they were unsafe. And within six months, they went down with everyone on board dead. Jeez. Well, one of them got snagged by a sub. A dude. sub? Yeah, th- that's the scariest one, dude, is when you're trawling out there. You're dragging, you know, you're dragging nets and going for like shrimp or bottom fish, whatever. And uh, 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 one of those nuclear subs will go flying by. And those things are traveling like 25 knots underwater. And they, they just, they're, they're, you know, they're like 600 feet, whatever they are. And they're, they're huge. And they snag a, you know, a 60, 80 foot fishing boat. And they lit my buddy, uh, well, my skipper saw his brother's boat just literally disappear, go underwater literally in three seconds. It was just gone. And like, there's just debris. And I had a buddy that was, um, he was in budge, you know, the, it's like the, there's like a couple, you got to go through like a couple sec, uh, levels to get to a Navy seal. And then the, the buds is, uh, if you, you if you stop there, you go into like the UDT teams, like underwater demolition and that sort of stuff. And my buddy was a in that he wasn't a full seal; he was in the uh, the UDT. And he said twice he had to go and cut, um, take torches and stuff and saws and get all the netting and whatever wrapped around from the fishing boat, like you know the 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 pole arms, whatever's attached, it's wrapped around the front of the sub in the conning tower, and they have like those fins that come out on the side and those would they, there'd be you know just boat wreckage wrapped around it they'd have to go out there and they'd come in at night and cut the stuff off at night so like people didn't see it so much because they can't let they would never let us know where they were and i had another uh boat that um i fished on that that's what they think happened too was the, those guys went down and uh they just were gone and they think that was a sub one but they they can't let us know because then the, the Russians would know them for all we know, it could have been Russian subs. I mean, cause they were out here too, you know, so they're, they're sneaking around spying and listening and testing each other. And so, but yeah, subs, subs take down, uh, not crab boats, but trawlers. Jeez. That's crazy. I never would have thought subs. I would have been like, Oh yeah. A storm went through, uh, you know, B- Billy, that name just keeps coming to my, my mind, but you know, Billy, you know, forgot to drop the anchor or something, right. you know, like, holy crap, man, that's crazy. Um, yeah. So I like, I'm not like terrified of, you know, the ocean or anything like that, but my wife is. And so there's like next to zero chance you'll ever catch me on any kind of large boat out in the ocean because my wife won't have any of that. So <laughs> she's, she saw a uh, perfect storm. I don't know what it is, man. Like she, like she doesn't go out on. It's uh, like she never would go out on a boat her whole life. She's been terrified of water. I mean, uh, it, it, she has nightmares about you know drowning. And it's just like you know most of the time when she wakes me up, kicking me in her sleep because she's having a nightmare. I know it's freaking her trying to swim to shore. You know, 
It's like, Uh-oh. it's wild. Uh, I, I tend to not even remember my dreams unless I take melatonin. And then usually I have some funky dream I wish I didn't have, you know? So, right, right. <laughs> but, uh, man, that's crazy. I, I, uh, I had no idea that you did that for such a long time. But, uh, at what point did you start migrating into this whole Bigfoot thing then? I mean, like, was it that you went from being a fisherman right on the TV for finding Bigfoot? Like, what was that transition like? Yeah, I actually fished after the first season. I fished again because we didn't, we didn't make my, we didn't make anything hardly and nothing to sit around on. So I fished that season and then we got picked up again and um, I got a replacement and I bounced. Wow. So it it wasn't that long. I mean, you fish for one season and then you're you're off and running. Um, and that, what I from what I understand about these TV shows and stuff, like the, like the first season, it's just like a wash for the person on the show because the, the network doesn't know if they're actually going to make money on it or not. So it's like nobody's really committing money to anybody in the first season. Is that how it's kind of working, right? And then you sign these contracts and like the contract sucks. You're like, I'm not signing this crap. And then luckily, I had a really good agent and. Um, he just said, he goes, he goes, no, they'll, 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 uh, if it, if you're a hit, they will up, they will up it, you know, they'll up it. And I said, they'll, they'll, they'll keep you happy, you know? And, and so we did, we, we really popped big for them and, uh, you know, for this, for the standard of, of those channels and what their normal ratings were, we did really, really well. I think we were like tied for second. I think we we're the third highest rated show on there. Wow. That they had on there. Yeah, like they, that they've ever had on there. River Monsters is the most popular show they ever had. What? Really? Yeah. Why? I never got into that show. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, a big fish. Good job, man. <laughs> I love that show, man. Yeah, that guy, Jeremy's gnarly, dude. He he is 1,000% the exact guy you see on TV. Like, he is just all about fishing. He doesn't. He 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 hates having to film. He just does it because it pays for it to, for him to do it. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Uh, wow. Um, so th- this whole like going into TV and stuff. I mean, how does like? So you said my I had an, I had a good agent. Now I've been I've been in the the you know I, I guess podcasting is the entertainment industry. Um, I've been in it for seven years. I've never had a, anybody come to me saying I'm an agent and I want to be your agent. I wouldn't have any clue on how to find an agent. Like, like what were you doing that you had an agent to even start with for this TV show? Oh, well, this uh, girl, uh, well, young lady, uh, Corey um, Christopher, she was an intern when she was at Long Beach State. She was a, um, I forget what, God, communications with entertainment emphasis or something like that. But she interned at Skunk Records. That was the Sublime, the old band Sublime. That was their that was their label, and so and my buddy Miguel owned the label. And I used to actually stay at his place down in Long Beach when I was down there with him. And she was uh, working there. I got to know her when she was like nineteen, and then she uh, switched over out of music into television. And then um, she worked her way up, and she was working at a uh, APA agency, and um, she set me up with uh, the. Actually, no, she was still doing music then. And she, yeah, she she's still doing music, actually. But she hooked me up with this guy that was like a big time, you know, because uh, we were like nothing. We weren't even, we weren't even signed yet, you know, and it was, and no one expected our show to do shit. Like, I mean, oh, sorry. I mean, no one expected our show to do anything. But so like no agent, like you couldn't like, because I know uh, Matt called around. He was trying to find one and Renee was trying to find one and Cliff was trying to find one. And I, I called a, uh, I called Corey and said, "Hey, can you can you find a TV sh- TV guy?" And so she got me this guy, Josh Levin Brown. He he does all co- he does he's done you know huge reality stars like uh, you know like the biggest ones like whatever Kardashians and like some of the Osbournes and hmm. Deadliest Catch and all that. So I was like just a nobody, and but she she told him to take me on. So he. Uh, took us on and he, it was, it was great. I, I gotta say, if anyone's going to do a TV show, get yourself an agent. Well, that's noted because <laughs> funny you say, no, uh, there's, there's, um, there's a slight chance that the confessionals gets turned into a TV show. Um, they're, they're working on some things in the back, but I'm not really expecting it to actually happen, but if it happens, maybe I should look into getting an agent. So, uh, uh talk to me, dude. Oh yeah, for sure. Like the, you're, 
you're uh, off the top of my head. You're like one of maybe five people that I know, you know, come from a TV world that could actually point me in the right direction. So, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. But you know, I think it's a long shot. But we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm not really willing to compromise on a lot of things, and so um, it's going to have to be really. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, I think you and I talked about this before and stuff into being independent is really like the, the way to go. Nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's telling me you got to say this, what not. And the, the contracts aren't, you know, you know, tricky. TV. You don't want TV, man. It's, it's a dying industry and yeah. you can do what you can make way better stuff and probably make more money doing it. Just going your own route, you know? Yeah. I, I, I just feel like, uh, you know, I, I'm happy where I'm at here, you know, at podcasting and, and, you know, Merkle Media doing our films. I, I don't really need TV. Uh, they kind of need me. So it's going to have to be on my terms, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I'll tell you this, dude, this, I know for like with everyone, they'll tell you what you want to hear to get you, they'll do whatever it takes to get you signed. And then they just start grinding on you, trying to get you to compromise on this, 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 and this, and this. Like, and, and, and the producers tell you, will tell you whatever they need for you to, uh, they'll tell you whatever they need to tell you to get you to do what they need you to do to, to make it, to deliver a show, to make a show that, that sponsors in the network are happy with and the viewers. Yeah. So like they'll, they'll tell you like, Oh yeah, we're going to do this. You, yeah. You guys can have say over this and that. And then when you get out there, they're like, Oh, well, there's been a little change in plan. Sorry about that. This is, you know, and it's like, it's just like a freaking fight, man, for, you're, you're always, you're always, if, if you, if you have integrity, you know, and uh, have a vision of how you want things in certain, in certain ways. And they're just like, you know, like they're, they're, they've got their own agenda. They don't, uh, their, their only job, dude, the, the network's only job is to deliver the most money they get. They have a fiduciary responsibility to the investors, the, the stockholders. That's their only job is to get them the biggest return they can. If that means cutting these corners and those corners, or fudging this, fudging that, that's what they're going to do or try to do. You mean they're not doing it for the love of the art? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, like the camera guys and stuff. I mean, and usually it's the field, the field producers are, um, they're usually like really, really cool. And, but I mean, at the end of the day, they're all, it's, it's a job for them all. You know, like they're not coming up with a super big passion of that the, well, they, you know, for lack of a better word, well, they call us talent. Um, they're not everyone's coming from different angles with different objectives and i mean everyone wants yeah. to have a, a hit show or you know be as popular as possible but they'll they'll sell you up the river like i, I know people have been on other bigfoot shows and they're just like dang dude like you know the guys that have worked on like three four different bigfoot shows and like then I've worked on ghost shows and um whatever you know paranormal shows and they're just like you know it's it's uh it's it's not a it's not the most i mean it's i mean it's fun you have a good time you meet a lot of cool people and they take care of you in a lot of ways but it's still you know, having the freedom to do your own stuff is is having that peace of mind is it's hard to buy that off you know and i think you can do better doing it yourself anyways nowadays mm. yeah I, I think the landscape's changed a lot even since i started podcasting seven years ago i mean uh, I remember when when I started podcast before I started podcasting, um, I, I, I you know I was driving truck and I remember watching Monster Quest, Finding Bigfoot, and uh, driving my tractor trailer and I would listen to Sasquatch Chronicles and and whatever. And uh, then you know the podcast starts up and you know those TV shows were still hitting hard back in 2017. You know, like uh, and. And it's just it's just a different landscape, I guess. Now the way the business yeah. is being run, and I imagine 2020 with the COVID stuff really did a number on the industry. I mean, that's why Disney's laying off so many different people when it comes to like ESPN and things. They lost yeah. a lot of money. They lost a lot of money. When you shut down an entire global economy, you feel that effect for years. And you know, TV picked P TV picked way up because everyone was at home watching. Like Netflix mm. went crazy, and then when people went back to work, that's when it just bellied up. Mm. It, it, is that because is that because uh when everybody was watching tv they were all at home watching even the people that usually make tv nobody was working during that time so people are watching yeah but when it's time to go back to work there's nothing 
actually running yet. Like there's nobody doing anything. So you have to get the gears moving again. And that takes time. Right. Is that what right. it was like? But I mean, well, I mean, they're, they get ad revenue for how much, you know, viewership you have, how many people they've got, do they, they know like when you rewind, like they know how many people rewound for like what, cause it like the, like watching it live, the, um, you know, like the, the, the executive in charge at animal planet would, or, you know, the VP or the president would be go, Oh, but when you said this, that you got like whatever, 37,000 rewinds. And like, <laughs> there was like so many people said something, this on Twitter or whatever, or Facebook. And wow. like, they, they'd watch it. Like they'd watch it like that, you know, like, and so they'd try to like, you know, they're just trying to get as much, they're, they're trying to like, you know, make a, make make viral moments that they can and um they're just trying to you know get get people's eyeballs on the product is is all they're really doing and they 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 uh like discovery dude i know this that they spent for every dollar they spent on production they spent the same amount researching and doing polls and feedback and um like what they do is they set up there's these theaters and like uh, everyone has them out there these theaters in vegas because vegas gets people from all over the country and all over the world. And so they get a total mix. There's, there's everyone goes to Vegas, like every race, color, creed, age group, they, the gambling addicts come in all, all forms. So they'll, they'll get them out in Vegas. So they, they, um, run, uh, trailers and, and cuts of the shows, like, you know, the, like the, uh, the pilots and stuff like that and, and get feedback from the people like, what did you like about this? What did you not like about that? And they'd, recut it or have us film some different stuff like like this and then they play it for other more studio audiences and then they get feedback on that and then they do tons of of uh yeah polling data and um they're they're pretty on it like they, they know what people like mm. so there's a lot of analytics that go into it um and and that i would fully expect that for sure uh you mentioned earlier about how you guys were looking around, I guess, for agents in the beginning and stuff, which kind of led me to feel like this wasn't something like like those boy bands back in the early 2000s, late 90s, where, you know, it, like uh, Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, like those were put together by a music producer. He strategically put those guys in a group to make right. a boy band. This is something that seems like you guys all knew each other, were friends beforehand, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like Matt and I, Moneymaker and I have been friends for, uh, geez, you know, I'd, I'd known him for, I guess, seven years when, that, when we started. And I'd known Cliff for five, four or five. Like we were, Cliff and I were partnered up. Like um, I was telling Cliff, I'm like, because I was getting offers and I was having a lot of people talk to me about doing a TV show, but mm. it was like MTV2 and CMT and uh, who else was it? Um, God, I can't remember now. Um, the old uh, Outdoor Life Network and History Channel, like, were all hitting me up, going, "Hey, you know, let's let's shoot a pilot, let's do this and that." And I just, I, I wasn't really in it. I, I, I'd be like, I'd say, "Well, I want some say on it," and they, they'd just be like, "Yeah, right." You know, <laughs> and like MTV two, like MTV two, dude, like they, they really wanted me to do it. I pitched this because they, they called me and just said, um, you know, from people I knew and down in Hollywood in the music scene and sh- stuff, and um they were like yeah you know just uh come you know come down we'll do this and that and then so the mtv2 guys said i they said what, what would you want to do and i said well i had this idea this was this was back like in like 2001 2002 i said uh um I, i'd like to because i do i have a lot of friends like uh in the action sports you know like surfing and uh motocross and stuff like that um uh, and you know a lot of the alt kind of you know kind of punk and new wave and alternative bands like i knew a lot of people in that that world and so uh i pitched an idea where i'd take like a like if we went to washington get like uh grohl or chris novella like to come out and then um like some you know like one of the bmx or motocross riders from from that area of washington and then you know like then uh like a a pro snowboarder or skateboarder that also like you know because most a lot of those guys you know play music on the side and we'd go out we'd really go squatching and then at night around the campfire each week we'd write a new song and do a a bigfoot song you know like with acoustic instruments out there and, and, wow and so at the, end of the, at the end of the season we would have had a whole album because that's when albums still sold out was pre you know all the digital sharing online and stuff so like yeah. that's when the industry still was actually 
happening. So like it was, it was kind of like a two for, you know, you'd get, you'd get this acoustic album with all these disparate, you know, disparate, uh, people. And, you know, we'd have every, every, uh, episode have at least, you know, like local, some, you know, I had guys from like no effects and Pennywise and some, um, you know, some of the guys, uh, um, some rap, you know, some of the rap crews and reggae bands and, uh, like the sublime guys. I mean, we had and the guys off warp tour. Um, you know, there's just a lot of like those kind of guys, like green day. And so we, they, they're all like excited. Like, yeah. You know, go out for like three nights, go squatch it and, and, you know, hang out and just have some beers on a campfire, like all were Thurman and this and that. So they were, they were in it. Then they offered me. So the first season would have been, I would have been writing, hosting, producing, um, the whole thing. And at the end of the, the end of the, at the end of the year, I figured out for taxes and agent, um, I would have got 13 grand for working like 20 hour days. Jeez. And they were going to like just bank it away. And they'd be like, well, if it, if it hits, we'll, uh, we'll redo your contract. I said, no, I want to see it in writing ahead of time. Like what if we hit, cause I, I thought I was going to be popular. I'm like, people are going to watch this. Like this will, this will be popular. You know, and you guys will sell, sell some albums off this too. The compilation. I'm like, like, like they weren't, didn't want to give me any money for like a comp. Like they didn't want to give me any money for the music and they, they were going to own all the music. We'd have no rights to any of the music. And so I just, I just kind of put it off, put it off. And then when this one uh, came together, um, it was just kind of like, well, yeah, you know, and then, so I, I just told everyone when I was, when I was getting courted again, like, uh, I, then I did sag it. I did. I, no one really saw that one. He only did six episodes of, uh, Strange Days with Bob Saget. Mm -hmm. Our, I, I produced like I was the basically the field producer for that one. I put the whole thing together. Wow! And um, I, I did. Yeah, I put the whole thing together, and they were they were still going. It was their highest rated episode by far. And then I had uh, then I had all the uh, I had a lot of people calling me. Like Saget's company wanted me to do a project with, like you know, do a show. And, and I just told all of them. I said, I'm not doing nothing without Cliff because Cliff and I had been on. We took off. He, I, I convinced him to take a year off of being a teacher. I said, Dude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get. A, and that, that's when house prices were spiking before the housing market crash. I said, Cliff, this market's out of control. You got to sell your, sell your house. You're gonna make a ton of money on it. You're gonna make a couple hundred grand, and then come up. and We'll just go squatching for the year. And if you don't, if if it if we don't get a show, then you know you can go back to teaching. So he was gonna go like teach at Hoop High or something up here on the res or, you know, something like that, or, or then he went up to Portland, but we spent like 14 months just driving up and down the, like all around the West coast. And we did like 10 weeks out, just out in the Hills, you know, straight, just, I mean, we come into town and get ice and food and stuff, but we just, you know, didn't spend the night in town or come into town for like 10 weeks straight. Then we'd go, we went to the Canada and Washington, Oregon. And I then we filmed a couple episodes of monster quest during that time. And then, Saget, uh, the next year we did Saget, and so I was getting all these offers. And I said, Yeah, as long as Cliff, as long as it's me and Cliff. And then, um, Animal Planet, uh, was looking for people, and I was that was the thing is people could never get a hold of me, like I wasn't, I never had, I never listened to any contact information public, and I, you know, I, I just kept, I was pretty low, and I had, you know, pseudonyms I, you know, I used for like, uh, MySpace and <laughs> stuff like that. So like uh, I got a call from my buddy Bart Bart Catino. I'm actually going to squash with him tomorrow. I'm leaving uh, Wednesday. I'm leaving with him for a little while. We're going to hit the mountains. But anyways, uh, yeah, he called me up and said, "Yeah, they're they're, they're going to do a a group get together down at Wally's house. He was the the billionaire guy that funded our um, our research like equipment back then. And you know, he he put a, a lot of money into supporting the the BFRO and moneymaker and uh you know he bought property for the he he uh, bought the property for the olympic project up there you know with the nesting sites and all that so he was he was gonna so he uh they flew us all down at wally's house we met down there in orange county and they uh so they, they uh picked us and then there was this woman pam from ohio and she was really really cool like re really into squatching and they liked her, but then she got cancer. She ended up actually dying like pretty quickly of brain cancer. It was a total bummer. And then um, they were, they couldn't find a woman that they that they really liked. They, they wanted to have a woman that was a skeptic. And <coughs> so, they, uh, but it took them nine months to find a woman they 
they liked enough and they want someone that was not you know gonna what they're really afraid of you like one of the reasons you don't see a lot of women on a lot of the reality shows is they're so, unless they get unless they're older is they're so afraid of them getting pregnant because they can just mess up the whole thing you know they can really throw a shoot oh, schedule off wow. so um renee's like oh, don't worry about me i'm not having any kids so <laughs> um yeah then they uh so yeah then they got all four of us together and then then it just went from there that's wild that's wild yeah i i didn't know how it all came together and stuff and i just assumed uh matt you know being in charge of the bfro i i i thought he had you know headed the whole effort up to get in the tv show it turns out you you were working on it since the early 2000s that's wild uh, I, I didn't even, I didn't know that, that, uh, you and Cliff, you know, went around for 14 months squatching like that. That's, that's incredible. So, I mean, that, that's really a testament to your friendship and, and, uh, how much, how close you guys were together where, you know, you're like, I'm not doing anything without Cliff. So it's either me and Cliff or nothing. And you, cause you knew that Cliff, you know, he, he put a lot on the line. <laughs> you know? oh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I've been. Uh, Cliff was an undiscovered gem back then, you know what I mean? Because they were looking, they wanted, originally they wanted Bart because Bart's like this big, you know, buff, real good looking Italian guy. Like, you know, just, he's a, he's a total character. And uh, they, they, they didn't understand, they, Cliff was more undercover to those guys, you know, like uh, they didn't, they didn't realize what, uh, I mean, a lot of people did, but they wanted, you know, like this big, uh, good looking Italian guy, you know, and, um, but they were stuck that, that when it's all said and done, like, they were the happiest with Cliff out of all four of us, mm. for sure. Yeah, he, he caused the least problems and <laughs> contributed the most. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I could I could see uh, at least out of you three guys, I could see how Cliff would be the least uh, trouble. <laughs> oh, my nigger was the worst guy they had. They said <laughs> I don't and even. That was, that, that was like with swamp people, or whatever. Like uh, deadliest cast there, like. <laughs> Yeah, our, our loosest cannon is Moneymaker. Oh my gosh, that's funny. I, <laughs> I, I don't know Moneymaker yet. I'm gonna meet meet him on Saturday, of course. And uh I I just I I just seeing him on TV though and seeing you get you on TV and all, I, I just I, I can see how Cliff is like, hey, we like Cliff because we know we're gonna get with him. We don't have to worry about what he's about to say, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh he's professional. He's he's you know, he's he's you know, I like it. So that's cool. Um Man, that's that's wild though. I, I really I thank you for sharing that because I, I didn't know that. Maybe that's old news and everybody knows that who's, you know, the who's who and Bigfoot and people know that. I didn't know it. I, I don't really follow uh people that closely, I guess. But um that's really interesting how it all got got assembled. Now, um, I know you have talked obviously at conferences and in the past. I mean, obviously you've had uh, Bigfoot encounters. Uh, but what was your mindset and you can feel free to share like the first time you had a Bigfoot encounter, but, uh, and I don't know if it was only ever one time or what, but, um, what was your mindset before the encounter? Was it something that you were looking for or is this something that you stumbled into and it, and it captivated you because, you know, it could go both ways for people. I mean, some people have these encounters and it just takes over their life. Yeah. Um, no, it, it, it took over way before the encounter. Um, I, I saw the PG film when I was about five, the Patterson Goodman film. And I, I had seen Planet of the Apes was on TV at the, you know, they were airing Planet of the Apes on TV then too. And I, I knew that I knew those weren't real. Like I looked at that and that was like the top costumes at the time. And I saw the PG film, it just struck me as that is real, you know, mm. like, and, and then the more I, and I've, I mean, I've literally, I've literally watched that footage at least 10,000 times. And I mean, they're still pulling information out of that thing. And I, 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 I have no doubt I, I, I would bet my life on it. That's, that's a real Bigfoot in that, in that film. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I got into it when I was like five and then I actually moved up to, I was from Southern California, moved to Northern California, um, got a job logging specifically to see uh, a Bigfoot and learn about Bigfoot and learn about the outdoors. Cause I, I was a surfer skate kid growing up, you know? And, uh, uh, my dad took us out we, for, you know, being in the city and stuff. My dad was a nature lover and we, we got out there more than most, but you know, was, we, we spent like at the end of the year, maybe we'd spend a total of like two, three weeks out in, you know, the, the mountains or the desert or whatever, you know? So it wasn't a lot. Like I, I was coming in pretty green. So I was like, well, John green said he's got the first real good Bigfoot books. 
he said, you know, if, uh, you, if you do a million miles driving or riding a bike at night in the, on the logging roads of North America, you'll, you'll probably see one. I was like, all right, that's what I got to do then. So there was, and logging was like the most exciting. So I, I got a job logging and I did, I learned a lot about, uh, you know, like the woods from those guys. And, and then I worked on some native American crews out in the woods and, you know, they learned stuff, but I actually, you know, looking back on it, it was so obvious. Um, you know, I live up in Humboldt, up in Northern Cal, I don't know if people know, but it's like weed, so it's the Emerald Triangle, Humboldt, Mendocino, Trinity counties. That's where like 80% of the weed in the U.S. back then was produced in these three counties up here. And so up in the hills, you know, there was growers all over and, you know, those armed groups and you had to be careful about stuff. And I, I was working with these gnarly Indian guys and um, two of them are actually in prison now for murder. <laughs> wow. but, so these guys were not like, these guys weren't shrinking violets. And when we get to this, when we were working this one unit, it was, we were there like October, November into December. And uh, we were at 4,000 feet on the North slope. And like, there'd be snow, there was snow on the ground. And we'd get there before light. We'd like, you know, sharpen our saws and gas up and get our stuff. They're just kind of, and then we had to hike down the mountain into the unit off the landing. But the, uh, the native guys wouldn't, when we were up there, like, cause we'd get not, there was knocks and whistles would come from like three or four spots around the landing on the, the top of the unit up in the uncut trees around it. And I, I thought it was pot growers or something. I'm like, but looking back on it now, I was like, Oh, right. You know, like we're, we're, it's like late November, there's snow on the ground. We're on the North slope. Cause they, they grow on the South slope where the sun is. There was no, there was no way there's any growers up there in the, in the snow and ice you know, on a North slope at 4,000 feet, but there would be knocks and whistles that we actually had a uh, food stolen out of our crummy up there. Crummy is like the, you know, the rig you used to drive up and down the mountain, the crew. And, uh, we had lunches stolen out of there and I thought it was growers. Then later on, when I found out, you know, the knocks and whistles were actually Bigfoot. Um, I told, I said, like, dude, you guys knew I was up there for that reason. And you, you just like, why didn't you tell me? They're just like, cause we're not supposed to you're not, you're not hmm. one of us. You know, you're, you're a white dude. We're, we're not supposed to share that information with you. And I'm like, I thought we were bros. Like, yeah, we're friends, but uh, you know, it's different now, dude. Like, uh, cause those guys are a little older than me. So, I mean, nowadays, like it's, uh, there's still, you can go to some tribes where they, you know, like the black feed and um, some others where, you know, some of the Navajo and stuff where they're, uh, you know, we're, you're an outsider. We're not sharing this information with you, but that, that used to be the, the rule like 30 years ago, like 35 years ago when I first started going on reses and stuff and trying to talk to people, it, it, there'd be a few people that would talk to you and they were almost, almost always younger. And now, I mean, but they, they've grown up, you know, with satellite dishes and TV, you know, so like guys are like in their fifties that are, you know, leaders and elders of the tribes now grew up watching the fawns or, you know, like, mm. uh, like they're, they grew up with TV. So like they'll, yeah. And they're just more open to it. Like they're, they're more, you know, the internet and everything like there's information flowing everywhere. And so they, they're, they're way more willing to share now. And, uh, so that's, that's, uh, I forgot how that, we got them in all that part, but you're asking how I got started, but yeah, yeah that's kind of origin story. Well, it's interesting because, uh, I had the same assumptions, I guess, with reses, uh, when I went to, uh, Utah last year for the, uh, the shape of shadows film that we're dropping next month. Um, we were on a reservation. We were uh, going to spend a week there. And I was like, you know, nobody's going to want to talk to us. And we had, we had like our own personal tour guide the entire week. Johnny was fantastic. And he just took us everywhere and just showed us all this stuff. And, and I think there is something to say about what you just said about how the ones that would talk to you back then were younger because those younger people are now older. And the, it, it's a whole new generation being ushered in. And you see that in just very different facets of culture and society. If you want to know what the future of your your culture and society is, look at the youth, because that, that one day they will be decision makers. And we're that, doomed. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> well, I, I was I was trying to kind of lead the horse to the water, but not force the drink, you know. But you're just like we're doomed. Yep, I know. Okay, we're there. <laughs> so, but uh, it, it's it's true though, and so. Um, with the with the res and stuff, it makes sense to me that now those younger people are older, they're decision makers, and uh, they have raised the next generation to be maybe a little bit more open because they were open when they were younger. So it's it's interesting how this all kind of transitions. 
Um, and it, when it comes to, you know, your personal experiences out there, uh, and I ask this sincerely because um, I don't know, or maybe I just forget, but um, what was, like, did you ever, like, come face to face with one of these things or see it from a distance uh or 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 are you still on that life quest of finding bigfoot i haven't had a great setting i've seen i've seen them i know i've seen enough to know they're there and they're real um uh i had as far as face to face the only daylight setting i had was we measured it out it was 63 64 yards away is when I had long hair and I was bending down to get a recorder, audio recorder out of, out of my truck underneath the seat. And, uh, cause we'll, uh, let's go back. Um, we were down at uh, Laos camp in Bluff Creek where the PG film, we were down a couple miles downstream from the PG film site at this place where we all camp, uh, Laos camp. And I'd been going there for years and years and years. And like, there was a little bit of stuff going on. Like I'd hear stuff at night, but nothing that I could take home to the bank, you know, like, unless, unless it was like, a, unless it was like one of those things that people describe, like, you know, Sierra sounds, roaring, howling screams or monkey, you know, the, whatever, like, um, I mean, I may have had them around me, but I just didn't know, you know, uh, I was, I was, cause I was always told that you're only going to have one encounter if you're lucky in your whole life. And I was like, I've heard that before. That couldn't be anything, you know, that couldn't be the same thing. And so whatever. So anyways, I, um, I was down there. Me and my buddy were hiking down. It was, it was, uh, it was a hundred. It was the hottest day ever recorded in that, on that day for that, that day in history it was the hottest day. It was in July. It was actually, um, yeah, about exactly 16 years, 16 years ago. Yeah. 16, uh, 17 years ago, um, July uh we went up there and we were just gonna go look for tracks so we, we went i'd always go downstream everyone else would always go upstream towards the film site I'd always, I'd always go downstream and we were walking down there and we were you know like wading through the creek and climbing over rocks and there's little sandbars in there i was checking the sandbars because i've seen impressions in there but i never saw anything that was like you know they'd be bigger you know as big as my foot or bigger but you know you, you just you, you, there's no toes no detail um so we we were we we were going down and all of a sudden we start hearing like loud knocks and then some whistles, like those chirp whistles, like, like that kind of, but more of a chirp to it. Yeah. Kind of like a, but yeah, like kind of like you'd hear those. And then these big rocks, dude, like I was a shot putter in high school and like the strongest guy in the world, I think it was like close to 80 feet. Oh shit. <laughs> what was that? Oh no. What happened? My dinner. Oh no. I guess I was bouncing around so much, it bounced off the. Oh man, shit! Sorry, Tony. Hold on one second. You're all good, man. Whoops! That's a mess. <laughs> I was getting all excited. Yeah, I was bouncing down on the couch. Monsters. I got old flannel. I just threw over it so she doesn't see it when she comes back in and getting looks. Oh, I'm not even tucking the mic. <laughs> yeah, I'm debating. I'm debating whether I keep that whole section in. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, do, what you, do what you want. This is real life with Bobo spilling yeah. his dinner all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what were we talking uh, about? I don't remember. Uh, so we were going down the stream, and then. All of a sudden, these uh, so like uh, saying like the shot, like a like the Olympic champion shot putter was like somewhere around eighty feet throwing a sixteen pound shot put, you know. And these things were this thing was throwing like 30, 35 pound rocks were coming um, to the north from the north side of the bank, coming up and over the trees. And these trees are like 30, 40 feet because we we were hearing them land behind us. This big, they, they weren't that close, like fifty to eighty feet behind us where they were impacted. Probably you know fifty feet behind us mostly. And uh, they just hit and just explode, like hitting the water, just kabloosh, water go flying everywhere. And when they hit the rocks and like just, ex you know, make a huge noise and ex maybe break apart and explode. And then I, I finally just started, you know, looking over my shoulder, um, looking backwards. And I saw, saw the rocks coming over the trees, arching, you know, going like 40, 50 feet high. And these rocks were big, dude, like, you know, like volleyball sized rocks or bigger coming out wow. and you know, it was like someone throwing bowling balls out over, you know, over these 40 foot trees and they're, they're probably going 40 to 50 feet in height and traveling like 
a hundred, you know, 80 to a hundred feet, uh, uh, distance wise. I mean, just something that a human could not do. No way. And after a while, I just told my buddy, I said, dude, you keep going. I'm going to, I'm going to run back to the truck. And I had just the week before had my, cause, uh, the, um, I was down by the res and these guys broke into my truck. I, I left it there and I had my gear in there and I was only going to be gone for like 15, 10 minutes. And then I was gone probably about two hours. I was trying to find this, uh, where the, someone said they thought they'd seen uh, a Bigfoot up when they were hunting. So I was trying to find this spot and I was, and it was supposed to be real close to the road and I, I was gone. I came back and my gear was all stolen. So all I had left was an audio recorder that I had at home. So I, brought that audio recorder that's what i had with me that day but it was so hot i didn't even set it i didn't even bring it because it was 105 degrees i'm like there's no way those big hairy things are going to be out in 105 degrees in the broad daylight do they usually come out at night especially when it's hot that's like their mo so i I wasn't even ready and then um, i had my dog monkey and so my buddy he kept going down the stream he kept going on the creek looking sandbars and i jammed back to camp i had to go back i was probably a mile mile and a half and uh, nothing happened the whole way back. Didn't hear anything. I had no idea that anything was following me. Like I didn't hear a thing. My monkey didn't, you know, act any different. And we get back to the campground. You pull in, or I walked in, and uh, as like it's like a little driveway comes in. Um, it's all dirt, and and this little like, entryway comes in. And then my truck was parked directly straight. Uh, if you just drove straight in from the entryway, my truck was right there parked where you cut down to the creek to go swimming there's a little swimming hole and i was parked right there and i was bent down to get, i was bending down to get my truck and my as my hair was kind of like cascading down the side of my face so i was leaning down to get i saw i was looking um i saw my dog just all of a sudden tense up and like do the full point like she saw something like her head you know went forward her ears went straight up in the air and her you know her face got all tense and i looked at her then i glanced over my shoulder um to see what she was looking at and i just see this tall skinny hair all hairy head to toe um kind of it's kind of hard to describe it was like it was blackish gray like it was black but it had like a gray with a silver sheen to it like it was real shiny like it looked healthy but it was shiny but it also looked like it was sucking in the light it was it was i can't even explain it but the skin was kind of like a dark grayish black charcoal color kind of like um, so almost like kind of in between like black charcoal and burnt charcoal, that, that gray, like in between that kind of, and it looked like it just didn't have that, like didn't have hair, um, around the eye. But, um, I just remember looking at like, if I started, like, as I looked, I was, it went from my the foot up to the up and it jumped back so fast. I mean, it was, it was gone in a flash. And I, I almost thought like I hallucinated, like I had heat stroke maybe or something. I was like, what the, no way. But monkey was freaking out. What I saw was it was the left, I could see the left eye. It was, it was hanging out just enough with one eye, it's um, left shoulder and, you know, half of its chest and then part of its waist and its left leg. And dude, it looked like, do you remember Minute Bowl, the old basketball player? Yeah. Yeah. It looked like Minute Bowl if you put a, uh, a hairy costume on him with a wow. broad, but with a wide chest, but everything else was thin, thin. Like, dude, it looked like it didn't have enough muscles to move. Like, when you see those alien drawings of like aliens yeah. that are like really tall and super, super thin, like, like this thing looked like an Auschwitz survivor or something, you know, it was just, but it looked healthy. There was no patchy bald spots or like dull. It didn't look dull. And uh, the one thing that struck me was it had a real pronounced brow ridge because I remember the, uh, I couldn't see any any eye like I didn't, I didn't see the eye moisture. It was like the eyeball was set back in a cave because there was I couldn't see because I, I remember thinking like I should have seen the eye glistened, you know that uh, you know uh, with the way the, the way I was looking at it. And then I, I stood up. And I thought no way. And monkey was like growling and getting you know whining and and she she has no self preservation instinct. She was she was all about like going over there. And so I I you know closed the truck up real quick and got my recorder and ran down there and dude it was a it was uh the first time i really hit that wall of smell like uh no it wasn't the first time actually i'm sorry i had that happen a couple times before but it was it was there was dead there was no air but there's usually some kind of breeze blowing through there and there was it was just dead air there was nothing moving and i just remember taking one step and all of a sudden it just boom hit me in the face dude my eyes were watery um it just like curled your nose hairs it was just this stench 
and you could walk through it. And it was about 10 foot in um, uh, diameter. And uh, you could walk in and out of it for like five minutes. You know, it was like, I mean, I didn't do five, five minutes, but I mean, I, I just remember walking like, this is crazy. It was just hanging in this one spot. You could walk back and forth through it. And it was just, it was crazy, dude. It was so pungent. And then I thought, well, oh, okay. I, left out. I didn't walk over there right away. I grabbed the recorder and turned it on and sat there. And I thought, because I never, I never took my eyes, I never took my eyes off the tree. It was behind like a, uh, there was two old growth fir, or maybe three old growth firs, like kind of in a row, but offset a little bit. And they're, you know, probably four foot diameter, something like that. And uh, so I, I remember what, as I reached for the recorder, I never took my eyes off it, and I'm staring at the spot. I mean, I may, I maybe took my eyes off it for like a second, like I mean, as I, because I, I was reaching for the recorder and I saw it, and like I. As I was going down, I stopped and I looked and like I turned, faced it the whole way. And I reached down without looking away again and grabbed the recorder. So my eyes was off it for like literally less than a half second. I saw it for like less than a half second. And then um, my eyes were diverted for maybe a half second, like not enough time for it to run. I, don't, I didn't think, I didn't think it did. And I just sat there and I'm like, okay, they're probably going to like, if, if I know there's more than one of them. So, uh, Everyone told me like if you're focused on one and it's, it's kind of like trapped, like it can't get out without you, like it can't get away without you seeing it or exposing itself. Another one will like will distract you from the side or behind, like with a big hand slap or a rock crack or, or a scream or a yell. So I'm like, I'm not gonna take, I'm not, no matter what happens, I'm not taking my eyes off. Then I I stood there for about five minutes, ten minutes, <clears throat> just looking to see, like you know, waiting to see what happened. Because I know I know that they'll outweigh you. They'll 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 outweigh you. Like um, they'll. They'll sit there for however long it takes. So I was like, after about five or 10 minutes, I'm like, all right. So I walked over. That's, and then the smell was just hanging there. And then I went down, hung a left, going back downstream. It's the old Bluff Creek Road. It's, it's totally overgrown now. But back then, there was still a trail on it and stuff. And you could walk it. And it was pretty easy going for the most part. And so I start walking down there. And I'm like, I'm, I'm you know trying to track this thing. But it's, it's you know rock hard ground. There's pine needle duff and some leaf litter a little bit here and there. and and I'm trying to track this thing, and and uh, all of a sudden I come. So as you're walking down the creek, Bluff Creek, on your left, the, the creek's down below you, like maybe 15, 20 feet down below you, and you know it's it's making a little bit of noise with the water flowing. And then on your right, there's like about a 20, 30 foot um, section of like just trees and bushes, and then it, it hits the the canyon wall that goes up to, towards Onion Lake, but it's just a little strip of woods and it goes into like these, you know, 30, 40, 50 foot, hundred foot, you know, it keeps getting higher and higher. These dirt embankment that goes, um, along, uh, that turn that goes up to onion mountain, that road going up that way. So I, I walked that, dude, I literally walked that trail hundreds of times at this point, like literally hundreds of times. And I, you always were, I'd, everyone, we always would look to your left and look down in the Creek as you're scanning the Creek and across the Creek where they, we'd heard them at night across the Creek on that side. So, I always was looking down that, and I was looking at the four um, tracks in the in the sandbars down there. And so, you know, I'm walking along, and this time I'm looking on both sides. And also, I see there's this like four foot wide, nine foot high little tunnel that goes for about 40, 50 feet. And it's totally padded, like, I mean, full squatch, obvious squatch, mini highway, short. Then it went up to the uh, bluff there, and, I, and so I cut down there. And then I could kind of smell that smell as I was going on that on the cut on that little the big trail. I mean, I, I didn't have to duck or twist my shoulders and walk down it. I mean, it was just blown open. And as I got there, there was uh, some dirt and gravel still rolling down where the thing had scaled up. And I was just like, "No way!" So I went back down uh, to my buddy. Um, nothing happened the rest of the day going down. I, I went down and met him down there a couple miles down. We both hiked back up as we we're coming back up. I was, I was, I was ahead of him by a couple hundred yards. And at this point we weren't walking in the Creek anymore. We were just, we were burnt out. We were just, and it was hot as hell. So I was, we were walking on the, on the, on the, on the road, the old road, you know, it's shadier there too. And so we're, we're walking up I had monkey with me. And then all of a sudden dude, the, the brush behind me, just started exploding like just it sounded like like a offensive line just running through the woods just smashing stuff and fast dude coming fast like right at us like i'm like oh my like it happened so fast and monkey just shot after it i'm like 
no, because you know they'll kill dogs. I'm like, no, monkey, no, and I was calling her, calling her. <clears throat> and uh she just went, you know, barking and she ran into the brush where this thing was. And then all of a sudden, you know, I hear her like do a squeal. And then this thing never vocalized. I never heard it vocalize. It just was fast rushing around. And monkey comes running back out and her butt's kind of low. And she's looking over her shoulder and she's smiling and barking, kind of like happy and like wagging her tail. And she zips back into the brush again. Like, you know, a dog scoot with their butt kind of down low and they're like kind of happy, happy barking when they're yeah. playing. She was doing that. This went on for like, a minute you know a solid minute this thing and i was young like i thought she's gonna get killed wow and, and she was playing with this thing like running back i don't know which one it was but um she was it, it was just going she was playing with it and i screamed and, and finally said you know i was just cussing her get the hell over here you know and she i said come here and she and she finally came to me and she kept you know she's happy panting wagging her tail and looking over her shoulder back over there like kind of and she started to run back i'm like no stay and then we walked back and nothing else happened. Um, but then a year later, so that was the end of that, that encounter. A year later, we were uh, back there and it was a couple months. It was, or it was the beginning of May. And it, it gets, it's um, like this year, it didn't open up until like 4th of July to get back in there because of the snow. And then there's also like in those big rough winters, um, the Forest Service wouldn't clear. That was like low party ro roads to get in there. Um, so the next year we were the first crew and it took us two days to get in, you know, like clearing felled trees and shoveling snow and clearing rock slides and, you know, pry bars rolling off little boulders and stuff. So dude, there's no, no one was in there. There was no, like, I can absolutely guarantee there was nobody in there. And the first night we were playing like baby crying, uh, and some weird gorilla screams and stuff like that. And orangutan calls and chimpanzees and Sierra sounds. We'd play just all kinds of different stuff. And we were blasting it, just booming through the canyon. I was with my buddy Jamie J. He was a retired homicide detective. He was he was an ex uh, uh, Green Beret uh, Delta Force guy, and so we we're. Um, but he was he was always nervous of these things, even though he was like you know war hero guy and decorated and all this, and been in all kinds of crazy missions. And he he's more he was way more afraid of Bigfoot than he, than he ever was on any of his uh, missions. He was uh he was actually in real life he was the fifth group squad leader in the movie Black Hawk Down. Really? Yeah, they, uh, he was the guy that ran with his unit. But he had to run the seventeen miles back to the base. Wow! And he was just shooting people out of like window sills and stuff. Like um, they said, he had like a, an ungodly amount of kills that day. And they they uh, his commander tried to put him up for the Medal of Honor, but he wouldn't take it unless every guy that died that day got one. Also. Mm -hmm. He refused it but anyways um so I, he was with me so we're walking down so we walked down that that trail uh the road the old road and i, I wasn't you know i showed him like, hey, this is where the thing walked up you know blah, blah blah and we kept walking and he's like oh my knee hurts my knee hurts and i thought he was just afraid of getting away from the fire in the camp i said look you can see the camp i looked at were 200 yards from camp there's the fire right there as we stopped and turned around real quick um we were about 50 feet past where that big trail cut up and we see this uh this guy standing there and, and um, my, my buddy Bart, I was mentioned several, a few times already was Bart. Like he, you know, he's like six, one, six, two, like two twenty, two thirty, like, you know, weightlifter guy. And this thing look, it looked like Bart it looked like a, you know, like some, it, it really looked like, I remember in my head, it, it looks like a high school linebacker, you know, this pads on. And it, it was, it just kind of was like, we caught it. It was about, to, we thought it was Bart because Bart and Ranger Leiterman, He's a um, state park ranger cop that we'd go out. He's a good buddy of ours. So we'd go out with, and he, uh, uh, so we, they, we knew they were out. Um, they were, they were just hidden in the bushes with a uh, night, th not thermal, just the old Sony night shot, the old Sony, uh, camcorder with the infrared little glow button on it. You know, they just, they had a couple of those and they were hiding in the brush somewhere. So we thought it was Bart. We're going Bart, Bart. And it wouldn't answer. We're like, Bart. We're like, what the? And it was swaying back and forth next to this little pine tree. And there was, there was a pretty good moon out. I mean, um, not, it wasn't full or anything, but it was, you could definitely see, you could see the silhouette. You could, it was, it was the blackest black. It was, it was black on lighter black. It was just, it was just, it was this completely black, you know, figure kind of swaying back and forth after about five minutes. It just glided across and we're like, no way. And so we, we went walking back and, uh, it turned out Letterman and Bart had been hidden underneath like a 
camo tarp. We'd passed them already. They had heard this thing. Like they, we, they didn't, they didn't say hi to us when they walked by. They didn't want to get this one's way. So we'd walked past them like uh, several minutes before, and they were they were mad because they had been listening to this thing coming down. They heard it climb down an embankment, come down that little trail, cross mm. the the old road, and come onto the 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 creek side and the campground side. And it was in this little triangle of brush, like where the where the creek cuts in, like real close to the old road. Um, and then it, as if you went back towards camp where that, where the Creek cut in next to the road, it, it bows out as you're looking back towards camp. So the Creek's on your right, it bows out more to the right. And it does like a loop. It does like a horseshoe around the camping area. So it, it gets wider and wider by camp. So by camp, it's like, Oh, you know, it's, it's a couple hundred feet from the Creek to the road. I mean, to the old road. And so it's like a, it's like a triangle. So it was in, it was in, it had, it would have had to expose itself some way to get out of that little triangle. And it, and, uh, we didn't, we, it was, it was walking. They, they were hoping to surprise it, but knowing what I know now, I don't think it blew anything. I think it would, it would have known they were there and not exposed itself to them. But anyways, um, it crossed, we went back down there, we walked up and there was, you know, pebbles coming down the hill where the big one went up. The little one went up the exact same spot. And those guys were like, Oh, you blew it. We, we listened to that thing approach for like 15 minutes. It was, you know, coming down cautiously and they could hear it going through the brush and, and they were kind of disappointed that we spooked it off, but yeah, I mean, it was, uh, that was, that was, uh, when people say if you had face to face, those was kind of like, that was, that was my, uh, I had one other sort of face to face, but it was just a black silhouette, but that thing I was within 12 to 15 feet of. Wow. Wow. Now well, that's a lot more than I've ever had. <laughs> I, I had a glimpse of something that I don't, it, it kind of like what you were describing earlier. Uh, I, I didn't. I, I was like, I, I don't, it was so fast and I don't know what I saw. I, I, I think I saw something, uh, like almost like a, a light ashy gray or something, but, uh, it happened so fast when I jerked my head to look back, it was not there. And I was like, well, maybe I just got, you know, the weird stuff on my brain. Uh, so I, I'm still in my mind, I'm still searching for my first experience with these creatures. Uh, yeah. When people talk about how fast they are. I mean, it's like, yeah. Uh, my buddy and I might have seen one in Louisiana, a uh, small one. The, the people were seeing like a five footer, and unbeknownst to me, um, it's where his father in law had seen one. He was a skeptic. He'd saw, he'd brought his father in law to this place on his property. Um, it's right below uh, Boggy Creek. It's across the border on the Louisiana side, like next uh, Lake Down. And we were walking in, and we had our headlamps on. We were going back into this uh, little forest area to get down to where the, his camp was, just a couple hundred yards. <clears throat> excuse me and we both i mean we couldn't say we saw something but as our headlamp as you know, like when you turn your head when you're wearing a headlamp at night and like shadows you know the shadows move along with your light and all that mm -hmm. um he was he was we were both turning our heads like talking you know i was looking back to him looking forward again and and we're talking like something it was like at the edge of the light it looked like something because it was going opposite direction of the shadows but so, it looked like something upright just dashed like to our from left to right but it was so fast like it was as fast as i could turn my head that's how fast this this thing was moving like you know, like like turning your head fast like you think you like it was so quick i mean it could have just been a weird messing with our head kind of thing but we both were like we we're both like dude what? like we we didn't see it but there we saw something like there some shadow looking like going a, a opposite direction of the other shadows just so fast it was unbelievable so what do you what do you make of that i mean because it, the way you describe it there and the way i've i've you know i've heard people describe how fast they move like it, it that doesn't it doesn't seem like, did you hear did, did it no, make we didn't, but that's the thing. We didn't hear anything either. So like, that's why I didn't, if I would have heard it, I would have been like, dude, that had to be one. We didn't hear anything. So, but we were talking and walking and, mm. you know, we were wearing like, um, we had like rain gear on, like, so you got swish, swish of the plastic. Cause we were, we were just going to go sit in this, uh, tent because, um, we took, we, uh, we take old tents or cheap tents and you cut out the screen with the, the, uh, the mesh where the windows are and you, 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 you find the cheapest trash bags you can get green trash bags big like leaf bags whatever like go to the dollar store and get those cheap ones that are real thin and you, you cut those in half so like there's just one layer one ply 
Mm-hmm. You tape those over the where the windows go, then you can th- the thermal imager can see to them, but they can't see in, they can't see what you're doing inside. But you can therm out through those. The thermal sees through it. So we were heading down to the the tent for that. So like we were we weren't planning on like we weren't, we weren't trying to be like quiet or anything like that. So we were we were making noise, but you'd, you'd think you'd hear it, but um, it, it would have been on the trail just ahead of us. Just I mean, it wasn't far. I mean, it was. I mean, when it when the thing took off i mean we were within 20 feet Hmm. yeah that i i don't know it's hard to fathom uh what people like you just described uh and uh, other people as well the the speed at which these things move uh you know i I, i'm gonna i'm gonna take you down the 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 woo-woo path with me for a minute here (laughs) uh all aboard get woo-woo with me um I uh, to, to to just put it, I guess bl- uh, plainly, I have a very hard time uh, imagining because, like, I mean, what you just described, okay, environment and things like that, what was going on around you, but you know, people describe these things moving that fast, and they didn't hear stopping, nothing, and it was it was pretty close to them, like. Are these things just forest ninjas, or could we possibly be going down some some weird routes here? With the uh, maybe they're not just these physical monster like creatures in the woods, but there's something other than that, maybe more spiritual to them. Yeah, I dude, I it, it asked me in five minutes to get a different answer, but <laughs> I, I think I think they're a normal evolved species, like some kind of relic hominin or hominin or. I mean, I, I think they're they're just they're not unless it's giganto, but it seems I don't think they're really giganto either. But I think I think there's something we, we don't know. I think there's just that we have such a small sampling of of the you know of the archaic hominids that uh, it's it's we probably don't have this you know in, in there. We don't have the direct descendant. Probably probably we don't have it in there. But I, I think maybe that um, there's other ancient spirit forces in this universe on this world that <clears throat> that um maybe co-op them or use their form or use whatever forms conducive to them to uh achieve their own goals or um you know what i mean like uh, like skinwalkers uh, like maybe like uh they can like these spirits can can go on their use take their take over like their physical like you know maybe they can just mm-hmm. like for possess them whatever you know whatever i mean mm-hmm. that i'm just saying the possibilities that cross my mind like yeah um it could be other phenomena just uh shows you that but i mean as far as the creatures that are like digging through trash cans cutting running down deer i'm um, doing all the normal things that a a, a a living mammal would do um you know, it, it's it's hard. I can't say that they all have that ability. Maybe when they get bigger, they get the ability. I don't, maybe then they get to a certain age and like wisdom level, they can. Uh, to me, it would be that they could vibrate certain ways. Like maybe they could just do like some kind of humming and vibration and make themselves, or you know, make it so we don't see them. I mean, it's hard to say. And then people talk about portals and black holes and wormholes and all this. And I've been doing actually some research on black holes recently and. I, I I know it's not that like it's not this, but um, yeah, uh, the black holes are, are pretty interesting. You know that that's a whole other tunnel, but um, yeah, I mean there's there's some I did I'll, I'll tell you another story. We were up in um, it's, it's the biggest Indian burial ground found on the West Coast, and we were up outside of there, and it's a super sacred spot for the natives, and we were up there. Cliff and I, Cliff and I were up there. And, uh, we, uh, were, we had a lot of knocks and, um, some whistles and, um, a lot of knocking for a couple of days. And we heard, you know, heavy movement through the brush and some break, you know, this and that, whatever. And one night, uh, we were there after several nights and, uh, he's a lot shorter than I am. We were, we were standing in camp and we started hearing, it sounded like a, a Bigfoot walking down the hill towards us, coming in through the woods, coming down off the side of the mountain, walking right towards us. And we're like, no way. We're sitting there like, you know, bated breath, just standing there looking. And where that sound of the crunching and crashing 
uh, not so much crashing, but just, you know, something walking down through the, through the hillside and, you know, twigs breaking and this and that. I see this blue ball that I, I thought like I, I couldn't pro my brain didn't process. I've seen UFOs before, like plenty of times, you know, like balls of light in the sky and this and that. And, uh, this was, I was like, I'm thinking to myself like the, the mount, uh, I thought it had to be like some kind of satellite or, or a plane or a helicopter with like a, a weird blue spotlight or I, I didn't know what it was, but I'm just looking at it and Cliff had the auto recorder running. He has, he has this on auto, but he doesn't know where it is. He's, he's been looking for it for a couple of years. Like, no way. I go, what is that? Like I'm, I kept saying, what is that? No, like what? No way. And then I saw it go in front of a tree. Like the tree was behind it and it lit the tree up. Like, but it was like a soft glow. Like, it lit up stuff around it, but not very far, like like a really, really weak headlamp. Like, you know, like you can see like mm -hmm. five feet or something or whatever. And it was just floating, but where it was floating, you could hear stuff crunching and cracking. And then it just floated and went <clears throat> down over the hill into the valley. And I was like, just no way. Then the very next day, um, Bob Strain, I don't know if you know who Bob Strain is, but he's part of like the uh, North American Wood Ape Conservancy that area x mm -hmm. um bob bob and kathy strange west the archaeologist uh him and tommy amaron came in the next day to meet us to meet up there so we're all sitting there you know just um talking she, you know it's in the morning and all of a sudden this truck pulls up and this old indian guy jumps out it's, it's charlie tom he was known as the last wild indian he was in his this was like uh 2008 maybe something like that 2007 somewhere around there i think and uh so it was just he was like in his mid 80s at that point but so try tom jumps out i'm like hey no way try tom and he's like hey what's going on you know and so you know we start talking to him and uh his story was that uh he he was the known as the strongest medicine of all the medicine men in in north america um his grandpa and he, he came from a strong medicine family they, they were karuk which is uh, up from Hoopa. Like a lot of people know about Hoopa because of the Dave Pauletti's um, Hoopa Project book and stuff. And so um, the the Trinity River where the, the Hoopas flows into the Klamath River. A lot of people have heard of the Klamath. And Bluff Creek flows in just above Trinity River. Up above that is Bluff Creek, a few creeks up from the north. And Trinity River comes from the south. And then so where they meet, that's uh, the Hoopas on the uh, Trinity. And then from that confluence down is the Urox. They go down to the mouth of the river to the ocean. And then upstream is the Karuk. So Charlie Tom was raised Karuk. And in the 20s, uh, or I guess it was yeah, the late 20s or, or early 30s, um, you know, still wagon teams and stuff. Something happened with uh, his mother was attacked by some drunken miners, you know, and just like, I, I guess, raped her or something, you know, assaulted her. And his father, had been, his father got killed by some miners. And so his great grandfather and his grandmother bundled him up and, and took him off up into the mountains. And they went way deep out, um, way past where the, uh, Jerry crew and those guys put in the very first roads. That was in the late fifties. Like it took him into the sixties to get up where, um, where he was. And then they found the burial grounds and that stopped that go road from going through. That's was the Gasky Orleans road was supposed to connect the Oregon border, it was going to be a big cutoff route, like paved, like paved highway cutting through the, the mountains there. And, and when they hit the burial grounds, it got stopped. So Charlie Tom grew up out there and he grew up just totally wild. Like, um, he didn't, he, he didn't speak, uh, didn't talk any English. He didn't own shoes or anything like that. Uh, the only thing they had that was modern was they had a frying pan and an iron knife. And other than that, everything they, they made, every, stitch of their clothing was like deer sinew and hides and you know beaver pelts and bear pelts and his grandpa taught him the old ways and his grandpa was um alive was you know like a young man when the first white miners came into the area so he he remembered the first white men and so he grew that's how he grew up. that's why they call him the last wild indian and he came to town when he was 12 and uh so anyways he and he said that he saw his first bigfoot at five it was scratching its back and he said it was you know, he was a tiny little guy and he said you know he's five years old he saw this and he said you know looking he, he thought i was 12 or 15 feet tall but he said looking back on it, it had to be at least 10 foot and it was scratching its back and then when it walked away he went over there and looked and he pulled hair clumps off it and he rolled it up the hair clumps into a ball and kept it and he put it in his little medicine pouch 
And then over the years, he collected clumps from five different Bigfoots that he saw. And then he said that's where he got all his his medicine from. That was where he got his power. And anyways, um, so this this is the guy that jumps out of the truck going, hey, what's going on, you guys? You know, and he just, these guys just epic. And uh, so we, we're talking for a while. And then he had some white girl hippie chick that he was with him. And he's, and uh, she, he was teaching her uh, which herbs and medicines to gather for colds or arthritis, whatever. And they're gathering natural herbs and medicines up there. And um, he goes, yeah. And he said something about, yeah, like, uh, you know, some white girls learn the hard way. Like, like my second wife, she was a white woman. Right here is where she found out Bigfoot was real because she used to make fun of me and say I was just a crazy Indian, you know. And, and so I, I brought her to this campsite. We were the campsite we were in. Oh, and this is, I forgot this part. When he got out and he said hi to us, he starts calling out. He's like, he's, you know, just kind of, you know, just he, the guy was just full of joy. And he's, he, uh, he, he looks up and there's a, re, uh, a red tail hawk flying way up over like several hundred feet up and a couple hundred feet over. And he, he whistles and yells out, Hey, my friend, come say good morning. And then he looks up and he puts his hands to his mouth and cups his hands up and goes, Hey, it's Charlie Tom. Come say hi to my friends. My friends, come here, come here. And sure enough, dude, like right away, a rabbit hops out. And this rabbit hops up right to Charlie Tom's feet and just looks up at him. And he pets, runs down and pets it. And then uh, a finch flies up and lands on this low branch right above his head and starts chirping right at him. Never paid any attention to us. Um, and then uh, the red tail hawk flies down, starts screeching, comes flying down, lands on that same branch as the finch. The finch didn't flinch. It, and it sat there and like it, you know, just kind of was making noise, staring. Only they never looked at us. They only looked at Charlie Tom. And then he did his Bigfoot song to call him. I said, "Hey, Charlie Tom, can you just you do that Bigfoot call? You know, you said you can call him in." And that's when Bob, like he said, "Don't record this." And I, I feel kind of bad. I mean, I'm I'm glad I did it now, but Bob surreptitiously um, recorded him unknowing Charlie Tom against his wishes. But everyone's glad he did now because it, the song would have been lost to time. But it was the traditional Karuk song to call in a Bigfoot. And he starts calling it. He starts singing it. And dude, within a, within a minute, we start hearing crunching and rocks coming down, coming down the hillside right towards us. And we're all looking at each other, mouths open, eyes popping, going, it's like 9, 10 in the morning. And he's just like, we just watch. Oh, yeah. So there's like a couple rabbits, a hawk, a finch. And then all of a sudden, here comes a little family. Uh, couple of does and fawns like but we thought it was a bigfoot coming down the hill but they come into sight and it's deer and they walk across and dude it's this is a hunting camp i mean this is like there's you know um uh hanging hanging poles and stuff and rack like hooks and stuff for hanging your your deer all around there and and he just goes hey come and say hi and the deer walk over and i'll just come and snip him and you know, say hi to him, like give him a little nibble, like kisses, whatever. And he's petting them, you know, and talking to them. And they just all stand, just they all, and, and the rabbits didn't move. There's a couple of rabbits at his feet and uh, a hawk right there. And, and then, then he, and then he goes, okay, I'll see you guys later. You know, and, and the animals just dispersed, like they didn't run away. They just walked away, flew away, like casually. And then he starts telling us, he goes, yep, this is where my, I taught that, my second wife about, about Bigfoot being real. And, and we said, he goes, yep, I told her, I, I sang the song, and I said, you stand on the edge of the creek right here. You stand right on the edge of the creek right there, and you watch, because Bigfoot, they always travel the creeks. That's what he said, like Boggy Creek, you know? Yeah. And he goes, they come up the creek. So, and he's telling us about the Bigfoot coming up, and, you know, it snuck up behind his wife and shoved her into the creek, and she fell into the water. And he said, he just started laughing. He goes, oh, me and Bigfoot were laughing. We were laughing at her, you know? And, uh, and she was mad and yelling and screaming. And I said, well, why, why didn't she, how, how this thing just walk up on her? And he goes, well, cause it was traveling. So it was a blue ball of light. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, yep. uh, okay. I, I mean, I've heard the blue balls of light. Uh, we've had it on the show a few times. Uh, I know about the blue balls of misery. <laughs> that's, hey, I, you know, I'll tell you what, man. That's something that I don't struggle with. So it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> now you got me off track. Um, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Uh, the the blue light that you saw was Cliff. The Cliff was there. Did he see it too? He didn't see it. Did he? Dang it! Uh, if, if if I could do it over, dude, I would would just 
spun around, grabbed him underneath his armpits and lifted him up in the air so he could <laughs> see. I, I, I totally would have if, if, I mean, cause that was the most, that was the most paranormal, if you want to call it thing that I've experienced right. anything, or any, anything, you know, that's, that's the, that's the most mind blowing thing that's happened to me. So, I mean, he says that, you know, that that's Bigfoot. I mean, and you saw the blue light, but it's up to you to determine what you think. I mean, obviously, it's not a natural thing for you to experience the blue light in the moment and obviously just make that connection to Bigfoot. Where For whatever reason, that's what he makes the connection to. But uh, Well, it did sound like a Bigfoot walking where the blue ball light was. It was like, it sounded like something big and heavy walking right where the light was. Okay, but I mean, you're like... Do you say that was Bigfoot then? I think it was. Okay, so now we're getting we're, we're now see this is what I like. This is what I like. <laughs> so uh I mean or maybe maybe how, something that, that maybe something that that uh maybe I don't know like uh it might it might have been something that's like a like some really strong spirit that is we just can't even comprehend and okay it, can be not visible to us or visible as blue. I, this is beyond my comprehension, <laughs> but uh, it's just kind of rant, like loose, uh, uncongealed thoughts. Yeah. On it. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think it was what we, what we, what we associate with Bigfoot. Uh, yeah. It was associated with that. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, like it kind of, there's several things here. I mean, so earlier you kind of mentioned about, uh, or maybe you, you hinted at the idea that, uh, you know, you believe Bigfoot is ancient, but at the same time you suggested that either they could be possessed or maybe something else is going on. That's something almost like masquerading and, and, and taking on maybe like a former image. I and mean, we, we hear, you know, skinwalkers and doing such things. And why could a skinwalker not, why couldn't a skinwalker take on the, the image of a Bigfoot if uh, they can do other creatures? I mean, let's, let's just go with Bigfoot's a natural creature. Well, if they can do that with other natural creatures, it would make sense that they could do something like that. And I personally feel like there there could be a situation where we're dealing with, yeah, you saw what we would say visually is a Bigfoot, but it's not coming from the same origin as everything. So like, I, I think that uh, you could be dealing with something that's very ancient and physical and natural, and at the same time, be dealing with maybe some kind of weird lab experience experiment that went wrong, uh, or maybe not wrong, uh, but also on a spiritual level, it, it could be an entity. Uh, so I, I kind of leave myself open to... to interpreting it uh loosely i guess um but the blue light i mean he he goes with it's bigfoot you heard what you heard along with that uh so i mean to a certain extent it seems like you you, you can't you, i mean can you say that the blue light is bigfoot and bigfoot's just a natural physical creature i mean it doesn't seem like it it seems like that would be a contradictory well, I'll thing say this. uh the wife, his wife, when she got shoved, you know, thrown into the creek, she felt hands. But the people that were there, like uh, Charlie Tom, I, I think there was someone else with them. There was someone else with them. They they just saw a blue ball light. They didn't see a Bigfoot. They just saw a blue ball light, and it went up behind her. And then she said she got big, big hands went on her back and just kind of picked her up and pushed her, shoved her, threw her mm. into the creek. Mm. That's not supposed so, to happen. Bigfoot's supposed to be cuddly. Right. Well, he said that uh, he said that they were. La he said Bigfoot laughed and he laughed. <laughs> That's wild. That's wild. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I mean, so when you hear people that maybe do gifting and things like that, are you anti-gifting? Do you have a neutral vibe and feel on the whole gifting thing? Where you know, it's like let's build a relationship with this thing because they are. Um, you know, humorous. They they like you know playing games and 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 exchanging gifts. I think it, I guess just dude. It's like it's it's they're they're just they're not people. They're not humans, but they are like us in the sense that there's generalizations you can make about the about them as a whole. Mm -hmm. And then there's individuals with. I mean, you got you're going to have some that have brain chemistry issues. You know, maybe they got a bad concussion one time or 
Um, you know, like they just they saw their parent get shot in front of them, or they got shot. There's a, a child, like someone wounded them, like a hunter wounded them, or like a homeowner that panicked and saw one and shot them, or you know, like they just uh, or you might have one that's just born, so you know, born sociopaths or psychopaths, you know, like that have that tendency, you know. And I think it you you wouldn't, but I don't think you'd be getting those ones because I don't think you'd ever you wouldn't get any kind of friendly vibe off them. But I know a lot of people that have had really long term positive things to that but what most of them say is be careful about putting out food you're way better off putting out like trinkets and toys and like shiny things um versus food you can you can get uh you might get some negative reactions if the food stops yeah well i i, I would imagine so yeah i've i mean i've heard that um I, I've never. That's if you're getting at your house. Though. I mean, that's if you're gifting it in your backyard or you behind your barn or whatever. I mean, but if you're going out to a spot and you're driving a half hour out there and you're putting out, you live in town or something. I would, I, I would. I mean, I wouldn't worry about gifting at all. I mean, I, I, there's, they never hardly ever take anything I put out there. Like almost never. Like a couple times only. I think maybe twice have they taken things that I put out potentially. Like three times maybe over thirty something years. Yeah, I I would never get involved in gifting on my own property. That's for sure. Especially food. Especially food. Yeah. But I mean, I got pigs and, and chickens in my backyard. So if they want food, that's right there. So uh, yeah. they can have it. Um, but uh, I want to ask you about some other things here. Um, so you and I were talking, oh man, this is, I mean, I was still back in Pennsylvania and I remember I was sitting in my truck, uh, in my driveway and I had just got home from work and we were talking and you mentioned about how on the show, uh, I think you said it was in Pennsylvania. You guys saw something that at least was, you know, unusual, uh, not expected in water that didn't make the show because the show is oh, called yeah. Finding Bigfoot, not Finding Sea Serpents, you know? So uh, yeah. what, what was that all about? Okay, well, like, I have established, like, I, I surfed since I was a little kid. I grew up on the, on the ocean. I was a commercial fisherman for a long time, diver. I, I, I know the water. I know swell. I know wave action. I mean, I've, uh, like, talk, Belgium talking about foot anatomy is like me talking about waves and water. Hmm. So, we're jamming out. There's about a 35 knot wind coming in from our like two o'clock, um, one o'clock, two o'clock. And it's throwing up about a 18 to 22 inch little white cappy chop going across. And we're, we're flying. Like we're, we're jamming out in the boat. We're just hauling ass. And, um, there's a helicopter flying over. This is before, uh, when they're still using helicopters, no drones. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a helicopter flying above us and then there's a chase boat on one side of us with the camera crew and the producers. And they're like, Hey, we want you guys like to act excited, like point stuff out. Like, you know, like, you know, like just, you know, say, Hey, there's, you know, like just, just be animated. Like just, you know, whatever, just point and look and, you know, talk amongst yourselves and laugh, whatever, you know? And so we're hauling us out there and, you know, I had my, of course I had some good polarized sunglasses on and I'm seeing uh, fish jump. There's this lake. Is uh, it's Lake Kinsua, where the Kinsua is. It, we were by the Kinsua Dam, where the Kinsua Bridge fell down. Yeah, yeah. The tornado that's went where, through there. Yeah, that's where we were. Okay. So we were, took off out of that marina, and we're we're jamming straight out from the marina, heading. I guess we were just heading north. It was, and we're jamming up there, and I see these big carp. Like there's like two, three foot carp all over the place, and we see these. It looked like I think they were carp jumping. Like, I didn't know carp could swim that fast because these things were hauling ass and jumping out of the water. And I'm looking behind it, and it, there's something, like, creating its own wake. It, it was going with the chop kind of side, like a, like if, it, if the wind was coming, like, say, 130 out of the 130 o'clock position, this thing was going, like, a, from, like, was heading towards, like, a 830, 9 o'clock, kind of. So it was going mostly with the wind, but a little bit off. And it was it was throwing up a wake, and then I see I see I see a section of it, and I must have seen like 12, 15 feet of it, and it didn't look like scales. I don't think it was a sturgeon because there was no and it was sunny out. There, it looked like sea lion skin, kind of like it looked kind of like a sea lion skin, but it was there was no like sea lions aren't 12, 15 feet long with no sign of a flipper or tail or a head. You know, like it was just like like a 
like a, a wall, like a, like look at a section of, of wall moving through the water or something. And then it, it came back up and I saw it again. And I was, and I, I got a better look at it and, um, it just, there, I saw no features on it. Like I didn't see any kind of fin anywhere or nothing. I didn't see any hint of scales. Um, but I mean, I was a quarter mile away and I'm, I'm telling the rest of the guys in our boat um, to look and then I'm, I'm waving at the, at the, I'm waving at the camera crew and, and I had, and I grabbed the walkie from Renee and I'm like, there's a serpent in the water. There's something in the water. I didn't say serpent. I said, there's something in the water ahead of us. Look over there. And it was directly in front of their chase boat, about, a, you know, several hundred yards out. And then Cliff was next to me. I said, Cliff, look, 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 look. And then he saw the fish jumping and he saw, and that, that was right. The last time I saw the actual, the, as, as Cliff started looking over, that's the last, he, he just saw something that he didn't, you know, it was, it was going under at that point. Um, Renee caught a glimpse of it. Uh, I don't think Matt, Renee, Renee saw, she, she caught a glimpse, but she didn't get a good look, but then everyone was looking at the, but you can still see where the, like, it was like a wake under the water, like, you know, like a submarine pushing up a, under something underwater pushing up a wake like where you see a hippo running underwater or something and there's these carp just leaping i think i guess they were carp that's what they were, we were told they were were just leaping and jumping like flying out of the water and something big behind them and uh it looked i mean when you look when i look back on it it was like you know some kind of serpent is or eel like i think they're eels um some giant kind of eel was was chasing where it could have been like a smooth skinned catfish but the biggest catfish one like six feet long there's no way this was there's it could have been a catfish dude i would have seen you know the spine like the the, the dorsal fin or you know i would have seen something there, there was nothing like that it was just i didn't see any head or anything and i saw at mm-hmm. one point i saw it had to be 12 15 foot of section kind of arch up and go back under wow that's that's wild and to, to think that it happened and that was fresh water too, right? I mean, uh, well, yeah. yeah, of course it was fresh water because the the Great Lakes are are not salt water, right? They're they're fresh. Yeah, uh, I think I think that lake ties right into the Great Lakes. I'm pretty sure. I, I believe it. I'm sure it does. Uh, lake Erie is not far from there. Um, that that's wild, and I, it sucks for Cliff. I mean, that's tw- twice now you've mentioned the blue lights and the sea serpent, and he just misses it, like. I, I feel like I feel like seeing something like that would be paradigm shifting for Cliff, uh, and I don't even he's, know Cliff. He's, he's open to it. Like he, everyone thinks he's, oh, he's such a, he's such a you know. I think she's so smart. Like you know, he's just thinks she's Mister Science. He's like, like dude, he is open to all of it. He just he, what he always says, he goes, show me some evidence. Like you know, mm-hmm. show me. Like I just need. He goes, I'm evidence based. He goes, I, I'm strictly deal with evidence, not stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So whatever, but. He uh, he did see a black cat though when we were in Michigan. Is that right? I was the one that, yeah, I'm the only one that didn't really get a good look at it. I mean, I saw something like low, dark going, but I couldn't tell what it was at all. But Cliff, Matt, and Renee all saw the the uh, you know a black mountain lion, you know, cross the road and shoot up into the side into the side brush. Wow. You know, um, I uh, I was talking to a local pizza shop owner here, Legends and Lore Pizzeria. Shout out to them. Uh, Eddie is the owner, and um, he said that they, he had a police officer not long ago come into the the, the shop and ask him about. Uh, I guess has anybody reported seeing a black cat? And I guess this this officer, while he was in his vehicle, uh, filmed on dash cam a black, a very large black cat that walked across the road. It was he said it was so large when it ducked to go underneath the guardrail, its tail wrapped around the guardrail. Uh, oh, wow. And he he showed it to, uh, I, I don't remember what organization it was, but it was you know some kind of wildlife organization here in Tennessee. And at first they said, it doesn't exist. That's not real. And he's like, I'll show you. And he shows the video. And the guy goes, you can't show that to anybody. You you can't talk about that. And, uh, and so apparently he's keeping it quiet. But I... I I say I I say this, officer. If by chance you're friends with Eddie, Eddie says, "Listen to the confessionals," and you're listening right now. Uh, please get a get that footage on just your phone, and when you retire, you can talk about it. And I know a great podcast where you can talk about it. So uh, <laughs> uh, there's that. But yeah, the the wild cat, the black cat. I mean, that's something that I think uh, recently. I think in the UK is it the UK that's that's now admitting that they have these black cats. Yeah, yeah, they got some kind of DNA, I guess. I I, I got to call a 
My buddy Andy over there, he just beats the Brit. And- yeah, yeah. Andy uh, McGrath, right? Yeah, yeah, I got, I'm gonna give him a call. Actually, I've been meaning to, I've been meaning to call. I've been, I don't call anyone. I always mean I've been to call everyone for years, and I <laughs> just don't. But uh, I saw a black cat dude in broad daylight. Really, dude, coming back from Bluff Creek, my buddy Manny was driving in front of me. I was following, and we were going up over the Bald Hills, up from the Klamath River, back up over to the coast, over to Redwood National Park. And uh, I think he, I think he recorded it. I'm pretty sure he he passed away not too long after that though, and. He had, I mean, it was like, go through his footage. I'm like, dude, you have no idea how much footage this guy had. Thousands and thousands of hours. He filmed his whole life because his whole plan was when he turned 50, he was just going to watch his whole youth like every day and live his life over again. Wow. So, I mean, he was he was kind of a little out there in some ways. <laughs> he was classic. He actually was spending a year out on his own. Um, and he was doing a year without coming into town up in Southern Oregon in the mountains out there in the um, lower Cascades. Uh, east of medford and he uh broke his leg and then got hypothermia and then went into cardiac arrest and died out there and they didn't some hunters found him in the spring when the snow melted but um yeah it was pretty sad but he was he was in front of me i was behind him and this and everyone goes you saw Mel- like the, those black there, there's no such thing as a black panther because you know there's never been one recorded in history there's no pelts there's no nothing of, of black mountain lions mm. and and cougars whatever you want to call them panthers but I mean, I always heard of black panthers, like, you know, besides the group, I mean, you know, like the animal black panthers. And I, I just thought that, like, you know, you see them like on the batteries and fireworks, you know, black panthers. And I just thought like, there's, there's, there's just melanistic ones. And everyone's like, oh no, they're just, they're melanistic jaguars. Dude, I saw this thing in daylight, like casually walk across the road. It was, it was a mountain lion. It was a straight up mountain lion, just black. Jeez. Uh, do you, like, do you think there's a, cause when I, when I hear about the black cat thing, it, my natural inclination is to say, there's nothing paranormal about it. It's just a, a, a cat that's black and people for whatever reason don't want to admit that they exist. What do you think so weird about the black cat? Dude, the, I mean, they've hunted panthers to extinction in lots of parts of the country. Like the majority of the country, they hunted the mountain lions into extinction. Um, I mean, they're making their way back now, but. You know, hundred years ago, they were they were wiped nineteen by the nineteen fifties. They were wiped out all over, and now they're making comebacks. But never in all that time has there ever been a black one ever shot, trapped. You know, I know guys that have. I, I knew a guy that you know hunted um, for years and years, and he he killed the you know like seventy or eighty mountain lions in his life, and you know I mean, and he knew guys, and they they he had heard of a couple guys saying they'd seen them, but he'd never seen one, and he he'd never heard of anyone catching one, and. I mean, it, it, if someone got one, it would be such big news. I mean, there's, it'd be like, you know, someone would have like a picture of like their family shot one in 1930 or 40 or whatever. I mean, or even the 1800s, it would have been such an anomaly. It would have been known, you know, it would have been, it, it's just like, that's why I, I have trouble explaining it. There's, there's no, um, there's no examples of it. Mm. Well, that, okay. That I, I see the importance of it from that perspective. I was, more along the lines leaning like what's so weird and paranormal about it but i, I get the historical uh perspective from it um you but there's nothing paranormal about the what people report them doing there's never been anything reported that wasn't anything panther wouldn't do it's, you know what i mean right yeah uh so listen you you go out in the woods you i mean clearly i mean you're going out on wednesday uh for you know at least what a week or whatever uh, and you you go out looking for for the mysterious unknown, the the Bigfoot. Uh, are you open to the idea of possibly encountering something that you weren't out there looking for? I mean, obviously you had the sea serpent idea, but that was water based. Uh, what about like the uh, like? All right, so you and Cliff host a podcast, uh, Bigfoot Be- or Beyond. Uh, what's it called? Bigfoot and Beyond, right? Yeah, and um, I, I'm I'm a little dyslexic. I always get things backwards. Um, but you guys had me on that podcast uh, a while ago, and we talked a lot about Dog Man. Um, yeah. So you hear about this Dog Man thing, and I'm not asking if you believe in it or anything like that. What I'm saying is, is is are you 
psychologically open to the idea of possibly running across things that other things that shouldn't exist, but yet they do. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen UFOs out squatching, you know, I mean, so, um, I mean those things, but that, I mean, with Dogman and Bigfoot are so just, they're not, they're not in the same ballpark at all. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of evidence for Sasquatches, you know, like pretty good stuff. I mean, to, to, in my mind, they're already discovered, uh, with Dogman. I mean, you're talking about something that's just so freaking weird. There's nothing in the, in the fossil record, even close to it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, by a lot, like physiologically, like when people describe how they walk and, but it's a real phenomenon. Um, you'll meet Lee, uh, Lee and Jen Kirkland that they, uh, the, they, and Jeff, uh, Jeff Waldrop run creepy people management. Like there are managers for like appearances and that sort of stuff, conferences. And Lee, he saw one when he was like 15, 16, he saw one walk in front of the car, 15 feet in front of him, a seven and a half footer with the big bushy tail, like walking with its like kind of like a T-Rex arms, you know, held up like a T-Rex and kind of real wobbly. And he was the first guy that I knew really well that I trusted a hundred percent, like no doubt that they're not, uh, I know they're telling the truth. And when he told me that, that, that blew my mind. Cause I'd heard enough, like, you know, um, read the Linda Godfrey stuff and, you know, hearing stuff on coast to coast. And, but for years I'd tell people, they told me like they saw a dog man or a werewolf. I it was, I never heard dog man until not that long ago. I was always werewolf. I, people would report seeing werewolves to me. And I'd be like, no, I just kind of laugh like you silly duck. Uh, you saw a Bigfoot. You're just, you're, <laughs> You know, your mind's adapted to see a werewolf because you've seen werewolf movies. You, you just saw Bigfoot. You're just in shock, and you saw it as a dog or whatever. And then, like, and then, like, I said on our show a couple times, I'm like, man, I gotta apologize. Didn't listen to this. And I told you you're mistaken. Like, you know, I, uh, le, le, you know, legitimate people, like non non loony people, have seen these things, and I I can't wrap my mind around it. It's got to be. It, I don't think they're a naturally evolved creature. I, I don't think so. Yeah, I I would agree on that one. I don't I don't think they're naturally evolved at all. Um, you know, they're not around. Me. They're not out. They're not out in this part of Northern California. I mean, um, you know, I told you about uh, uh, Ranger Leiterman. He saw a giant dog thing with the giant ears on top. He said it looked like a, you know, like one of those Egyptian. Anubis kind of yeah. thing. It was sitting. He said it was huge, giant. He he likes to go on night hikes, and he was working down in the desert in S- Southern California, out in Maha- Upper Mojave, I think he was, or something. And he would do night hikes at night. He's he's in law enforcement, so he he would you know go out at these long night hikes, and you know just just to he liked to go out because it was cool at night, you know, because it'd be a hundred and something in the day. So he's out, you know, for a nice long evening, and he he'll hike 20, 30 miles. Like he's a nut. And he was walking. He said he just sees this giant, huge canine just silently sitting on top of this rock. And I think he said it, it was maybe five foot tall when it was sitting on all fours, four or five feet tall looking. And he said it was giant. And it just stared at him. And he didn't really feel especially threatened. He didn't get any kind of like mind speak or anything like that. He just saw a giant canine, kind of Doberman, sort of Doberman pincher looking, but bigger. Um just sitting there looking at him from not very far away, just in, in the full moon, just watched him. It, it turned his head. He had, a, he kept his eyes on it. And it kept its eyes on him. And they just watched each other as he walked by and then it made no movement. And he just kept hiking and nothing else happened. Wow. See, but yeah, we don't get them. The redwoods, we don't get them up here where, I, where I'm at. Like there's no stories around here. I mean, I heard uh, someone say on some comment section, like they saw one up around here, but, I don't know, dude, like the tribes don't talk. I mean, they have them in their legends, but like, it's not a thing like Bigfoot at all. Or like the sea, the river serpents, K Moss, like they know all about the serpents and they know that they're a biological reality. Bigfoot's a biological reality, but, um, the, this dog man thing is, uh, it's not, it's not in the same category. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me ask you this final uh, question. This is kind of going back to our first half of this conversation when we were talking about just life and your life. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you this earlier, and I forgot to. Um, you, how long was the TV show on? It was what ten years. Well, 
from start to finish, like from when we first started, uh, I think it was nine, nine and a half. I think it was nine years from the first meeting till the final episode aired. Okay. It was nine years. And how many seasons? Uh, I looked on discovery plus there. Yeah. You know, uh, I looked on Discovery Plus the other day and I was trying to find an episode because my girlfriend had only seen one episode ever. Oh. And she wanted to see Monkey. She didn't give a shit. She didn't care about me at the end. She didn't <laughs> want to see Monkey. She said, What episode had Monkey the most in it? And I'm like, I think this one. And uh, so I was looking at it, said that it said 12 seasons, but like one of the seasons was like three episodes. One season was like four episodes. Mm. And then, so I, we, I think and the way I count them, like of the runs, you know, like where we'd go out for like however many months or whatever. I think we'd, I think we'd put it at more like nine seasons or eight or something. Okay. We did a hundred. A hundred episodes. Yeah. Isn't that like syndication or something like that? That you know that that was a thing of the they don't do that anymore. The uh, syndication hundred that was the cutoff, and we were trying and just before we got to the hundred, like because you'd get bonuses for that, mm-hmm. like you, you um. You got it was it was a pretty penny because we don't get any kind of residuals like what? The reality shows. No, unless you're like unless you own the show like the Kardashians or like Josh Gates or Nick Groff, you know, or um, what's his name, uh, the other guy from Ghost Adventures, uh, Zach, Zach. Um, those guys they all own like they their their production company actually makes the show, so those guys get residuals. They 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 do really well, but if you're just talent, you. Yep, you get you get a paycheck and then you're done. Because everyone thinks we're like making all this money off all these reruns and marathons, and we don't get a penny. That sucks. Yeah, that's why. That's why. Well, that's one of the reasons that reality, i.e., unscripted television, was so popular with the networks, is because they didn't have to pay writers and they didn't have to pay residuals. So that's why. That's why it just exploded. Plus, it was they were popular, but they were cheap to make. Hmm. I had no idea about that. I, like. I, I I started gearing up for a question and you started throwing all this other stuff. I'm like, wow, this is, this is interesting. So, uh, all right. Good to know. Now, uh, let me, let me, let me ask you this though. Uh, so 12 seasons and a hundred episodes finding Bigfoot, uh, the only show from that era that I think in the, in the same vein of topic that could hold a candle would be uh monster quest. Uh, oh, yeah. I think people watch that prolifically just like they did your show. Well, uh, monster quest was bigger than us. What was it? Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. in, in the Merkel household, it was kind of even right? Uh, right. So do you, how do you view the four of you and what you guys were able to accomplish for uh, maybe Bigfoot culture, not community? Uh, I'm talking like the, the conscious public. Yeah, the consciousness of Bigfoot to the general c- public. Uh, do you, uh, how, I'm interested to hear how you view that because I have my own views on on that from the outside looking in. But do you do you see? what you guys did as something that actually moved culture? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's not my opinion. It's just the fact that, um, from when the show started till the show stopped, that, uh, public belief in Sasquatch doubled and not because us is because of the witnesses at the town halls and the witnesses we went out with and did recreations. They were so compelling. So many of them that, that, uh, people said that's what switched them over was. Mm. So we, we, we presented it to them, but it wasn't, me uh, that that convinced people Bigfoot's real it was the witnesses. Yeah, yeah, and and that's yeah. go ahead. It, it definitely had a, it definitely had an impact on on pop culture and uh, just the general view of of Bigfoot and um, it, it has. And I think the biggest impact is with the kids, like like me grow like me growing up like Boggy Creek and in search of when I was a little kid. Those just hooked me really. And like, there's a lot of young adults now that. You know, we're like, you know, 10, 12 when that came out. Now they're like 23, 24, and they're going to grad school to be anthropologists or biologists. There's a lot of youngsters coming up that got their exposure as a kid that just lit a fire in them for the subject that are pursuing it from a professional academic, uh, you know, pursuit. And so those people have, a, they'll have a big impact. But I mean, you know about the DNA study they're kicking off back in that, uh, God, well, I don't want to say his name. That's Moneymaker's doing the big at uh, uh, the Silicon Mountain Conference this weekend. They're going to Moneymaker's going public with that. 
it's a major university on the East Coast uh, that has public funding, government funding for uh, to go over Bigfoot evidence, like take a look at it because mm. it's a direct result of the UFO um, files coming out and the whole UFO disclosure. Really? There's a movement now for um, the Bigfoot thing. And Tim Burchett is a good buddy of ours. He's a, uh, he's your congressman from where you're at yep. in Tennessee. He, he says he's, he's all, uh, when the committees come out, he's all, when I, cause he's in his third term, I believe now, I think it's his second or third term, but he said that um, he's going to get a, a committee together uh, hopefully in 2024 and go at it like the whistleblower of the whole thing come forward no whistle whistleblower protection for any fishing game officials forestry the department of interior whoever and a lot of military bases like there's a lot of stuff on the military bases like just any government person that has ndas or worried about their job security they can come forward with no repercussions and and present whatever evidence or testimony they have about the validity of sasquatch and i think that's going to just like you have know, the UFO thing is going to blow people away. Yeah. Well, that's exciting to hear. That's exciting to hear. Uh, and I'm also, I'm really glad to hear your perspective on the work you guys did because I share the same sentiment uh, from the outside looking in. And, uh, you know, it, it's good to be humble, but it's also good to be realistic too because if you're not realistic, then you're not humble, if that makes sense. Like, like you just, right. you got to be honest with yourself. And And the fact is you guys... You guys really did something for the world. And I think that it's something that you guys should always ho hold your head up about. And, um, you know, I, I listen, like, there's a lot of people in this world who, you know, put their heads down for the final time and they have way, way, way more regrets than they ever could have imagined they would have had. Uh, you guys. I'm sure everybody has regrets, but I, I think what you guys did and stuff uh, really changed uh, the perspective of what this could be. And uh, you're right. The town halls were a really big deal with that. And so yeah. um, kudos to you and, and the gang. I'm looking forward to meeting them on Saturday. When people hear this, it will be after Saturday, but um, I'm looking forward to meeting them. And uh, man, listen, I'm going to wrap this up here, but uh, let's let's do this again. We didn't get the UFOs, uh, dude. I, <laughs> I, I that you did say you have UFO encounters. Uh, dude, I I was with the National uh, Dave Pauletti's and um, Dennis Fole and uh, oh, Jim. I think it was put together the Mile High Conference where they brought in like Bigfoot and UFO together. Uh huh. And uh, I was sitting with, at dinner with the National Director of MUFON Investigations, and I was just telling him like a couple of my stories, and he was like. That is, he's all, I've heard one or two other people describe that same thing. He goes, he said, he said that, that when I told him, I, I, I thought mine was like run of the mill. And he said, those were, he said it was a pretty amazing. Really? Well, tell me about it. Do you have time? Yeah. I mean, it's my show. I can go as long as I want. It's just, we were going for two hours and I want to hold you up and it's, you know, well, whatever. I'm wide, up. I'm wide open, dude. I mean, I'm, I can go, uh, if you, if you, uh, don't you have like that Patreon part or something? the patreon's like three years ago man i have oh, okay. <laughs> i have memberships I, I, on my website now uh no but i mean this is all just going to be this is all public it's all good uh okay go for it okay so um and i think it was 89 88 or no it, it was 88 or 89 um i was going to humboldt I, yeah i was, well, I was I was working in the woods and I was going to school on a couple nights a week. And so I was going to Humboldt state part-time and, uh, I was at my buddy's, um, on campus apartments and I went to go meet my buddy. We were going to go surfing and his roommate came in and was just totally shooken up. He was just like, like, and he knew I was totally all about big, you know, big foot pinned on my surfboards and stuff. And he, he knew I was all, like I talked about it nonstop and, he just came in and he was, he was in shock and, and he just said, he goes, wow. You know, he goes, uh, we're like, what's up? He goes, you're right, dude. They're real. You know, they're, they're there. And, and he, he wasn't like bragging about it or he, we had a pride out of him. He was really shooken up. He said he was fishing on Redwood Creek, which is right. Just, it's a Redwood national park, a little town of Oric. He was fishing on the, 
north up, upstream from the town, but inside of the town, it's right there. It's like a quarter mile away. And he's fishing there where the levees begin. And it was really, really foggy. And it was uh, mid October. And it was just pea suit fog along the coastline. And you're, you're less than a mile from the ocean there, probably about a mile. And so you get that coastal fog. And he's sitting there fishing and he uh, coming down the embankment of the, the where the levee starts, you know, it's gravel and stuff. He'd hear, you know, the elk come down they, and you'd hear him hit the water and they'd start surging, you know, like walking into the water. And then, you know, you'd hear less and less as they got deeper and deeper. Then, all, then they'd, they, you wouldn't hear them at all. They'd be floating as they were floating down river. They would be uh, swimming across and you'd hear them start surging out as they got their footing, you know, and then hear them come out of the water, the water, you know, coming off them. And then you'd hear their, their hoofs on the, on the, uh, the cobblestone rocks there. It's, it's all rocky. And he was fishing for the steelhead run. So he's sitting there in, in his waders out, you know, about a third of the way into the creek. It's, it's really like a, it's, it's, it's the size. A lot of places would call this a river. It's, when it's flowing, it's, it's, it's river size for sure, like a small river. And uh, he's sitting there fishing. And he said, all of a sudden, he hears some, like a, he thought it must be a, a couple of big bull elks coming down because there, there's, uh, you know, you'll see like four big bull elk that time of the year before the rut really kicks off hard. Like they'll be kind of cruising around each other. So he thought it was uh, some bull elk coming across. And he said, they hit the water. And he's just hearing whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And he said, and then he could hear the, like, you know, like the, the thighs going in the under or then, but he could still hear it surging through the water like as it was stepping. Like he'd hear it like surging across step by step. And like the arm, I guess the arms were kind of like doing like a swimming motion. He's like, what the hell? But it, they, these things weren't drifting down because the elk were coming in to his left up creek. And then as they hit the midstream, they'd, as they started swimming, they'd go down, they'd pass him in the fog in front of him and then come out just to below him down river a little bit and then come out and exit and head up head up back to the woods on the other side of the creek so this thing never lost its footing so it didn't drift past him it just came right out to the side of him. he said it looked at him glanced at him like you're nothing boy and just looked straight back ahead and then walked looking at the ground and saw where the elk tracks were then it just went off after the elk but he said it was about eight foot eight and a half foot probably about eight foot um you know he he you know like six seven eight hundred pounds like bodybuilder buff just huge and it just happened that day because i I've, I've been looking around for bigfoot stuff and i've gone to like you know bluff creek and um places where it was in the newspaper but i had never been the first person to hear about something i'd never heard about anything that happened that day like i was so excited but i just had my license suspended <laughs> so I, I couldn't drive and then so my buddy's girlfriend and her friend i'm like hey let's go up there she goes well i gotta work we can go up to this evening. I said, Oh, great. I go, Oh my God, I'm going to my first Bigfoot investigation. I've got some plaster and was so excited. And sure enough, she gets off work. We jump in her VW bug. We go driving up there. We're driving up uh, Highway 101. Up, people on the West Coast went to Trinidad. We're heading up towards Trinidad. We're going on the 101 north, north of Moonstone Beach, where it leaves the beach and goes in, <clears throat> into the woods. And you're heading parallel to the coast, heading north. And we see these chicks are kind of trippy, uh, hippie chicks from Sonora. Like Sonora's a UFO hotspot spot. And they had been talking about UFOs all like they came back from summer break and were like, oh my God, they were working out there at some camp or something. And they were like, the UFOs up there were, you know, they, they'd talk about them all the time. I was like, oh, you know, all right, I believe in that. I've never seen one. And all, we're driving up there and there's this red light floating in the sky directly directly in front of us kind of drifting north slowly over the it would have been out over the ocean because it was pretty far it was miles away but it looked like a uh kind of like a sort of cigar shape red light with like a white tip on the on one side of it and i'm looking at it going like oh whatever and then the girl in the back seat's like look, leaning up between the seats going it's the mothership that's the ones we see it's the mothership that's the small ones coming out of that's the mothership and she's and the girl driving's like and the girl, I'll say this full disclosure, the girl in the back was totally stoned. <laughs> and the girl driving, the girl in the front and I were totally, totally sober. And, and she's talking about motherships. I'm like, God, she's really baked, you know, or whatever. We're, we're driving up and then I'm looking at it and she goes, that's a UFO. The girl driving, she goes, that is a UFO. That's what we'd see. And I was like, oh, no way, no way. And I just remember like, it was like a, like, it almost like seemed like, it, you know, I was in shock, I, but it seemed like it almost hypnotized me or something, you know, like, but I'm sure it's just my own self. 
and and I and it just it snapped my my brain just snapped and I could see it for what it was like that's a UFO that's not a plane that's not a helicopter that's a UFO because there's Coast Guard choppers fly out there all the time I'm like that's not the Coast Guard chopper no way so we we go driving up there and we got uh, right to the town of Trinidad the road bends oh I'm sorry we were heading due west and then the road bends back to the north again and starts traveling up the coast north. We were driving along like it's like a bay, you know, a point sticks out that Trinidad head. So we get uh, right where the town is, where it turns from west to north. There's a big opening, like the freeway off ramps are there. So the trees are cleared out real wide. And we pulled over right there and we were watching this thing slowly fly north. And there was a car about 100, 150 yards up the road from us, further up the road, pulled over. And as a couple cars passed us, you could see uh, there was someone sitting up on the side of on the the side of that car watching the same thing we were and then it kind of went started going behind the trees head north i said let's go to patrick's point state park let's get up there let's, let's jam up there I, I know there's a perfect spot there's a perfect spot there's this rock six wedding rocks six out in the ocean you can climb out on it and there's and so you're out in the ocean you can for this point out and you got an unobstructed view well, let's go up there it's, you know it's like a 10 minute drive or less I'm like let's go let's go let's go so we jumped in the car and as we start driving, the, the car in front of us, as we get closer, it was a highway patrolman. And the highway patrolman was leaning on the hood of his car, watching the same thing we were. And I pulled up to him. I said, stop, stop, stop. And we pull up. I said, you saw that. Well, did you call it? He goes, I didn't call it in. And <laughs> we're, we're, we're like in the slow lane, just parked. And he's sitting there on the side of the car. I said, you got to call it in. You got to call it in. Dude, that's a UFO. You got to, you know, let, alert the authorities, call the news. You know, like this is big news. He goes, I'm not calling anybody. He goes, you think I'm crazy? I don't lose my job. And I'm like, you're not going to lose your job. You're going to be a hero. He's a, he just shook his head and said, you're blocking traffic. Get going. <laughs> so we drove off. We went up to Patrick's Point. Then we got up there. And at first we seen five. We did uh, that, that red and white one flew way out further away from the rest out over the ocean and then up higher. Then we seen five little dot, like uh, pulsing lights, like zipping around. And it was the weirdest thing because there was no rhyme or reason. Like there's, it's like okay, these things just travel across the universe, universes, whatever, to to check us out. Like why would they be flying erratically? Like no rhyme or reason. Like it just didn't make sense. And um, they had pulsed like blue green. Some of them were blue pulsing blue green white. Other ones were pulsing pulsing like blue white red, um, or just blue green. And they're just zipping around. But this one flew a little less erratic, a little more subtly, like just more gently kind of flowing. And the other ones were really herky-jerky. And it was the one that was only blue and green. That was the only two colors that it pulsed. You couldn't see the shapes. They just like just like round balls of light. They're miles from us. And uh, so as we're, we're watching this. I looked at the girls and I said, does, does that one seem like, and they both said at the same time I said it, we all three at the same time said a female. And we're like, no way. And then Cassie, the, the other one girl, she goes, you got to sit like this. You know, you got to sit like, like whatever lotus position, you know, like Indian style, cross your legs in front of you and then put, put your thumb and forefinger together and then stick your, you know, middle finger and your ring finger and pinky straight ahead. You know, kind of like that Buddha pose. She goes, cross your legs and cross your legs. And she goes, you can ask me the question. I said, Okay, well let's we'll um we'll all ask it at the same time. If you're a female, spin in fast tight circles. So we did that, and the thing I, I said, okay, we'll just keep repeating the question. If you're a female, spin in fast tight circles. So we said it once. The second time we started saying it, it just goes and spun in really fast tight circles. And we're like, no way. And, and Cassie's like, yeah, you know, you can ask some questions and. I can't remember what else. I mean, I was just so blown away by that. I was like, no way. And then a couple hours later, like we watched these things for hours and four more appeared, but they kind of seemed like they were stars that just kind of started vibrating. And then like, they, they looked just like stars. They weren't really moving. And then they just started vibrating faster and faster. And all. next thing you know, they were like zipping around like the other ones, like coming, like look like they came closer. I mean, it's hard to tell what they're, it seemed like they got closer, but they're still a couple miles up, up away from us. And then, um, as we're watching that blue green one, it flew over to the, it flew over, um, big lagoon. It's a coastal, it's the biggest California coastal lagoon. It flew over that and it's right along the beach. And then the, it's, then it's redwoods all around. It's, it's, uh, all, all redwoods. And you can see the, the highway where the 101, the major north south 
artery along the coast of California coast, Morgan. And we, and, uh, there's a few, you know, cars scattered along there over, over a couple miles stretch. And that, that light, that ball flew over, got over by the highway and then flew over the highway. Then like this whole spotlight, but like real broad came down, lit up like, like a, several hundred yards by several hundred yards is just cone of light came down out of it and it flew over the 101 and hovered over the 101 and we saw traffic from the north like a couple cars from the north a couple cars from the south over the next minute or two come up and stop and just stop and like didn't drive into the light or just parked on the 101 looking at it you know just probably tripping out like we were that went on for like several minutes then it just the light turned off and it just kind of zoomed back up to where the other ones were then about 3 30 in the morning Something like that. We'd been watching for about five and a half hours. Uh, a, a group of uh, fighters came from probably, uh, I think there's, there's Edwards, uh, the, the Air, there's Air Force Base by Sacramento. So it, it seemed like they came from around there and they, they came flying over the ocean. And they, when they got to where the lights were, they, they went up and shot up towards them. And those lights just went zip and just, like a blink of an eye just shot off as fast as light and just shot like it must be going like 15,000 miles an hour, just shot up into the sky and we're gone within a, a second or two, like two seconds max. They were out of view. And those fighter pilots, you can tell they must have done this a hundred times. They just peeled off, flew back the way they came, got back in formation, and just flew away. They didn't chase them for two seconds. They just, as soon as they took off, they, they just peeled off and went back the way they came. And then we went up and watched them. I must have went, spent about 80 or 90 nights. We saw them over the next um, couple of years. Yeah, it was 89. And then in 93, my buddy was a professor down at San Diego State. Him and a, a buddy of mine, the, the buddy, he's now a teacher at Harvard Medical School. So these guys are like, you know, pretty academic dudes. They were, they were partiers too. Like they are our bros. So they came up here like pounding beers and shit and, I said, I go, do that. I go, I think they want to pick me up. I was telling him, I said, you know, like, I want to go for a ride with these things. You know, you want to go for, and this dude's pretty wild. He's like, he's the professor from San Diego. He goes, yeah, man, I'll go for a ride with you. And I said, all right. So he came up, we went out on the rocks and, um, my brother and his buddy, the other guy, uh, our, our mutual friend went back. They went back to the car because they were tired. We've been hiking around all night. I said, all right, let's just sit here and, um, you know, asked him to come pick us up and so i, I did like she showed us sat like little style put her palms up and that mothership they called the mothership the red and white one was way out way out over the sea it must have been you can see about 15 to 18 miles out to the horizon something like that about from where we were at our elevation and we, as soon as we started saying come pick us up it kind of like put us back into a and I, they kind of could tra- I, I know like you're in shock and stuff but dude there was numerous times we went up there with camcorders and good cameras and we never took a picture the whole time. Like you, it just would not even come to your mind. Like you were, you kind of felt like, like you had control of yourself. You could talk if you wanted to take a pee, whatever. Like you, they weren't stop. Like nothing was stopping you or anything. But just felt like they had like a, uh, like they had. Uh, it's hard to explain, but like the connection with you or something. And so I said, let's go for a ride. Let's help to pick us up. So we're sitting there saying, come get us, come get us. And that thing just all of a sudden dropped down. Like you ever seen like a spider house, spider drops down and just stops and kind of goes boink and just kind yeah. of like a, almost like a little bounce and just stops. It did that like exactly at our eye level it looked like, and then just started speeding towards us, like above the surface of the water, like maybe a hundred feet or something. And I remember just going, Oh my God. And like the reality of it was setting in, like we're going to get picked up. And I started thinking of Travis Walton and um, I got to be friends with him from going to conferences and stuff. He's a, he's a now that hearing that story from him, it's like, so I started thinking of Travis Walton and I was like, then my inner voice, like this deeper voice in me just said, Bobo, these things are not your friend and they are not, you, you, you are, you, you do not get on that thing. You, you do not want to get on that. It's just, this inner voice in my head just kept saying, and it was me talking to me saying, they're not your friend leave. And I was frozen. I couldn't move. I was like in a trance. I, I felt like I was really in a trance and I was fighting with myself going, dude, get out of here. Then I, and then I was just like, it was kind of like mental will, you know, I just said, all right, Bose, you can do this. You're going to get up and you're going to get out of here right now. And I said, get up. And I, and like, I just broke through. Like it just, it just shattered. Like I was out of, I was bam, I was wide awake and totally conscious and totally in, in the moment. And I just 
but I had total, total fear and panic in me, but I was, I, I'm really good at staying calm in situations that are hectic. And, uh, so I just go, all right. And I looked at it, Nick, I go, Nick, Nick. And he's just staring with his mouth. His mouth was wide open. His eyes were wide open. He was just frozen staring at it. I go, Nick, I grabbed his shoulder. I was shaking him, shaking him. I slapped him in the face. Six times I slapped him super hard. He looked at me. I grabbed him. I said, let's go. And he just sat there with his mouth and eyes open. He looked back at the thing. The thing's coming. It's getting close to us now. So it was, I'm guessing 15 to 18 miles away when it started. And it was probably five miles away at this point, three miles. So I grabbed Nick and started dragging him in this, the, the staircases out there and everything is all carved out of the rock. So it's all granite rock. So I'm dragging him down these granite stairs. And all of a sudden he starts going, oh, oh, oh. He, like he, he, he snaps out of an event, like after about 20, 30 feet of me dragging him down these granite stairs. And he scrabbles his feet and just screams and starts running and like just takes off. And so the, we were viewing it from the west side of the rock and the trail goes around to the back side of the east side of the rock. So you can't see out of this at that point. And you go down the back of the rock and then you, you, there's a little isthmus that takes you back to the main line. So, you know, it's right there. At high tide, it maybe gets a little wet up there once in a while. But, you know, it's a dry trail. And we started jamming up to the parking lot in the in the state. It's a state park. So we're running up in, in the, it's Patrick's Point State Park. We're running up there. If, if you ever go there, people, there's a, you'll see there's a parking lot that has an old gray whale, a life-size gray whale spray painted on the ground for like teaching kids whale watching up there. So it was like a 40 foot gray whale painted on the, on the parking lot where we that's the parking lot we were going up into. So as we go up that trail, it's, it's oh, there's these big, I forget the names of the bushes, but they're about eight foot high, nine foot high, something like that, eight to 10 foot high. And it's solid. And we're running up that, that path and there's, you know, and um, we don't see anything else. We see the red glow, red and white glow. And it comes between the, comes around the rock and there's a little Canyon that comes up. We're going up in the Canyon running up. And we see the light and all there's a, a sea lion colony and a fur seal colony out there. And they both just start going crazy. You just hear this, ar, ar, ar. it sounds like, like when, um, if a white shark grabs one of those things at, at night out there and it grabs one like off the rocks, they all go crazy. It sounded like that, like the full warning. Like, oh my God. Like we're imminent. You know, like someone's getting killed. It was that same barking panic, just full alarm sounds. And Nick and I are running up the trail. And I'm like, oh my God, I glanced over and I could see, I could see it was coming up the canyon right by us. And we get up to the parking lot and we just stop and it comes up over the trees and it's like a upside down lava lamp. And you couldn't see the exact like definition of it, like, but it looked like it was made of four panels, almost like that were pulsing colors. And uh, it was just pulsing like, like red, white and blue and purple. I think it was, and it was um, just pulsing. And then, on each side of it, it was about 40 foot tall and maybe, I don't know, like 18 something feet wide at its widest point. But it was like, it looked like an inverted lava lamp. That was the shape of it. But a little, not so stretched out as a lava lamp, like a squatty, like if you, if you shrunk down a lava lamp height wise and kept the same width. And it floated up over the trees and floated over us. And the whole time around it was uh, two red balls, like basketball size, were zooming around. Like um like like a, a beauty queen a beauty a beauty queen sash like from the shoulder down to the waist on the other side, like so say like that um if it was like a beauty queen's torso, one ball was going like like one sash like from the left shoulder to the right waist, like like that style, and the other one was going the opposite direction like left shoulder to the right waist, and they were just zooming around, like uh just zooming around it, and it, it flew past us it flew over our heads I'll, I'll never forget this we were both in such shock as it flew over our heads we just tilted our heads tilted our heads and tilted our heads and we both fell on our backs and i remember because i i thrashed my elbows like i hit on my elbows and it's gravelly kind of parking lot up there it was paid but it's like loose uh blacktop and i got that like embedded in my elbow i was bleeding pretty good i think i chipped a bone actually but that and then we just got to our feet back up looking and it stopped like not far from us, like there's probably 100, 120, 140 feet up in the air, something like that. And then didn't see any doors open or anything, but um, out of it came this like yellow hockey puck looking thing, like maybe five feet long by two foot high, something like that, two and a half feet high. And it just came out of it, like, but you didn't, it just came out, like, but there was no, no, no opening that we saw. And it just floated out away from that, the big ship. And then, uh, 
closer to us than the big ship was, it just all of a sudden, dude, just started spitting out those red basketballs, like those red balls of light, just they'd shoot out like a hundred miles an hour, like shoo, and they'd come out and within like 10, 15 feet, they would just lose all the momentum and just start floating slowly, like just gliding around. And it just goes choo, 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 choo. Dude, it must have shot out like 80 of them or in like 40 seconds or 30 seconds or something like that. I mean, it just shot these things out. And they all started floating around and they just were going through the trees. They uh, Some went back over the ocean. Some went um, into the meadows. There's a meadow right there. It's, uh, if you ever saw the original Jurassic Park, it's where the, the aerial shot of the velociraptors going in on those guys from all sides in the in the field. And it's an aerial shot looking down. You see the velociraptors coming in from six sides. That's the meadow it was in, in, in real life. And so then the, the big ship, and we're sitting there looking at this going, oh, my God. That, and then that orange, the, um, the kind of orangey yellow hockey puck looking thing, it followed us. We walked like a half mile out of the park, and it followed us almost the whole way. And, dude, we heard cars, jump, like people jumping in their cars, peeling out, ripping out of the, the campground. It was off season, but there were still people in there. It was springtime. And we were, I remember never forget looking over this family at this um, this campground in the woods right there. And I could see that the whole family, they, they were barbecuing marshmallows. There was yellow or red orbs in the trees. If they would have looked up, dude, they never they, no, they never showed any reaction. They, they didn't see them. They didn't, they didn't see any of it. They were all looking at the fire roasting marshmallows, and like wow. joking and laughing. And the, there was red orbs within 200 feet of them, like 50, 70 feet in the air, like just a couple hundred feet away. They never, uh, we, that, I know they never saw them. They, the couple of minutes that they were in view, we were like maybe three or four minutes that we could see that camp and we could see some other camps, campfires and stuff and didn't hear any reactions. But some dude comes running through the meadow, dragging like sleep bag over his shoulder, like tent with stakes dragging behind it, like all clink. You could hear the, the, uh, the tent spikes, you know, um, jingling as he's dragging, like, running with his tent and sleep bag over his shoulder. And the service goes, there's some weird shit going on out here, man. And he just sprinted just, and he was, you know, maybe hundred feet from us and he just was flying. We were just walking. Like, I'm like, I'm not running, dude. I'm just walking fast. Cause that, that the yellow one was following us like up above us, like behind us off to the side of like, it was, it was hugging the tree line going in and out of the tree line. And it, it flew by, it, it was closer to some campers than us at certain points. And then it, it followed us for about five minutes and it stopped. And we, and we were walking out of the park. We were cutting through where the employee housing is. And there were two um, park, park employees i think uh they're i don't know if they're biologists or what they were rangers or whatever they're sitting on the back porch watching it i said no way you guys saw that did you call it in they're like no they just smiled and shook their heads nope nope and they just smiled and i was going dude call that in that was crazy you got to call that in you guys got any cameras or like shake it. they never said anything they just, just said nope nope and smiled and shook their heads nope nope and then we walked out and we were just in shock and my brother and his buddy were um sitting in the car waiting for us we got in the car and just drove home just minds blown yeah that's like uh you bury the lead you know like that's wild that uh did you because i mean so the I, I think you said there were park rangers there uh and they're just kind of like they're employees they're they're in employee housing so they're okay. rangers or biologists or biologists or something like that but the way they acted was very it sounds very casual uh yeah like they'd seen it yeah uh in the moment of what you're experiencing like does that does that moment feel like like you're you might be meet, meeting your maker that day kind of thing or or oh shoot, I might actually take a ride in one of these things. Like, like it, was it that kind of like? Was there a fear, or was I this more sure curious? I was come back. I, there was something saying like, just I don't know, the guardian angel, whatever you want to call it, like your subconscious, whatever. Something was telling me it was my own voice, though. But it was my own voice, really clearly saying, "This is not the or not your friends. Do not get on that thing." But so, but they didn't do anything to us. They never hurt us or anything like that. But Man. That's just the feeling I got was to get out of like I was I didn't want to get probed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I totally understand, you know, like it, they have a bad habit of doing butt stuff. So uh yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can pass on that. Um Yeah. Then I, I had one other weird one that I saw and um only a couple I've seen of all the nights we saw those lights on there, that was the only time I ever saw a shape on those ones, except for, I think I saw the red and white one in the daylight at sunset one time, like the sun was 
below the horizon, but it was still totally light out. And it was the only time I saw one like uh, where you could see like uh, it was the only daylight setting I had of one. And it was just hovering there over the ocean up at Big Lagoon, the next uh, two lagoons up, maybe five, seven miles, something like that, five miles, four miles. And we had got done surfing. Me and my buddy were sitting there, and it was just it was just hovering out over the ocean, not far away. I mean, it was close, and it was way less than a mile from us. And it, it uh, flashed red and white. It was like a it was like a metal aluminum looking cigar. It looked like a cigar made out of aluminum, and it just blinked, flashed red white, and it looked like it looked like the red part, like like it looked like maybe seventy five percent of it, two thirds of it flashed red, and the other part to the the, la- the part of the right flash maybe a third or a quarter white and it looked like the red part shot off to the left like just boom gone but they were both gone it just blinked out like it was just boom there it was gone it was a flash of light and it was gone but the only other time i uh, saw like a real good structure of one <laughs> i was down i was off the lost coast and i'd always i spent a lot of time on there um i commercial fish down there and i worked down there um I surfed down there a lot and I was on a search with my buddy Tracy. We were going to boat up the next day to this place called Big Flat. It's on the Lost Coast. It's like a, was a secret surf spot. You can only access by plane or boat or if you hike into this snowy trail, like 11 miles or something, climbing over rocks and steep black sand beaches getting pounded by waves. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a beautiful spot, but it's hard to get to. And we were going to boat up there the next morning. There was a big swell pump and we were all excited. And we saw these two also, it was the first time I ever saw down there in Southern Humboldt that I ever saw lights offshore. It was those little zigzagging lights. There's coming, they'd come from a, below the horizon, above the horizon, uh, over the way out to sea, and just in those weird zigs, 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 zigs around, zap around, then shoot back down. So we watched that for a while. We're like, whoa. I was like, yeah, that's what I, I was telling you, Trace, that's what I've seen. That's what I've seen. He was like, oh, that's crazy. And then we, uh, we're, we laid down, we were just sleeping on, on the ground. We we're, Wait, you know, just a couple. It was going to be several hours till daylight. Then we we're going to boat up, go surfing, and we see this uh, ship coming, like uh, I mean, a, something in the air, and it was uh, it was shaped like um, kind of like a it had like a neck, like a it was it was metal. It was you know some kind of craft, but it looked like it had a neck and then like a shovel nose shark head to it, like it was a rounded kind of like not quite crescent. It was like a flattened out crescent shape and then it came so it kind of curved back and then it it, it went then it went back to straight lines straight back and then it did a 90 degree angle into where the neck would be like so the head like it so it curved from the front the furthest point curved back on both sides got to a certain point went straight back in a straight line did a 90 degree angle came not all the way together and then there was like a neck section section to the main body and the main body was it was like a nine? It was a flat, hundred degree plane where the neck connected to it, and then it slightly arched out as it went back to the back. It was slightly arched out a little bit, um, and then came back, and then it stopped. And it did a hundred degree flat plane across the tail section, and it it would uh, a look like a black beam of light would come out of it, like a funnel came out of the front of it, like a black beam. Then it would just shoot through the black beam and stop again, and then it would. The black beam would come out and it would shoot. It would shoot out this like cone looking with black, and it would instantly suck it forward. Like it, it was jumping, like, but fast. Like, I mean, it was doing like half mile jumps at a time, like, like, bam, bam, bam. I mean, it was, it was covering a lot of ground, but it was a really trippy thing. Like, um, I don't, I still, and it flew up over King's Peak, the highest coastal peak on the Western US. It's the highest coastal, and it's the mountain right behind Big Flat. And it flew over King's Peak and then flew down in. Uh, big flat cricket. It's, it's it's a big watershed. And it flew down behind the mountain and into the canyon, and we just sat there and watched all the way till daylight. We never saw it again. It was nuts. Like we never went to bed. We just sat there and we're just tripping out, going, "Oh my god!" And uh, yeah, that was that was pretty weird. And I told some UFO guys about that, and they were like, "This one guy was telling me he thinks he goes, oh, it was doing an antimatter beam, and it was creating a vacuum, and then it would suck the ship into the vacuum, and it was that's how it was propelling itself." What? Oh, that's what this some uh, MUFON guy told me. Wild, that was. that's wild. Holy crap! Yeah. Uh, was that like beyond your comprehension when he said that, or were you like, "Oh yeah, I heard that before"? Um, I've heard like antimatter and 
particle beams and you know, I've heard I've heard I used to listen to Art Bell, you know, so I I'd heard a lot of weird stuff. But I, I wasn't like a UFO guy. Like I was always like, well, that's cool to see, but I can't do anything about it. I'm not gonna go find footprints of aliens or hairs of aliens or record audio of an alien or well you know what I mean? You can go to Vegas now and find footprints of aliens, I think. So Really? Well, yeah, they had that crash. Did you see that crash? That that UFO oh, crash? Oh, yeah. Was there footprints from it? Uh, I I mean, I doubt it. I was doing that more tongue in cheek, but uh, I I mean, that I don't know what that whole thing was about. Uh, but you know, they 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 said they had like eight foot creatures in their backyard. You know, there's got to be some kind of physical. If that's true, there's got to be some kind of physical evidence towards that. You'd think, yeah, for sure. Did you ever see James uh, James Fox's movie, The Varinga Crash, whatever that one was, Contact, uh, Moment of Contact, I think it was, documentary on the UFO crash with the alien down in Brazil? Oh, uh, no, I haven't seen it, but I know what you're talking about. Oh, dude, you got to watch that. <laughs> Sorry, I will. <laughs> It's it's he did he did the two best UFO documentaries ever. He did that one. He did uh the phenomenon, whatever I think the phenomenon, the pheno- yeah the phenomenon that, where he had like um he got uh Harry Harry Reid the Senate the Senate Majority Leader retired from the, yeah. you know, head, the head of the Senate from Nevada had him on came out on public and said UFOs are real. I mean he he's got he had those kind of people on his documentary. I mean he's those are the two best documentaries I've seen on UFOs by far. Yeah, uh, Harry Reid. I think he was heavily involved in the Skinwalker Ranch as well when he was yep. active in politics, which has a lot of ties into the UFOs. Obviously, um, yeah. With uh, watch the Varinga crash. I mean, it, dude, it pretty much proves the U.S. has a crash and a body, a, a ship and a body for sure. I'm typing it down now. Uh, but it's James, if you look up James Fox UFO, it's his last two movies. James Fox, got it. Um, so what do you think it is with that, that people are seeing in the sky that you saw in the sky? Do you think it's like actually extraterrestrial from another planet, or do you think that there there's more interdimensional aspects of this? I mean, with what's been coming out recently, it does point towards interdimensionalism as well as extraterrestrial. Yeah, and then I, I'm I'm getting more and more of the idea of like they're they might just be from here, mm. just different planes, you know, different dimensions, like mm-hmm. parallel dimensions right here the whole time, and they just cross back and forth. I mean, I don't know. Like, I used to think like, oh, they're probably like you know doing like DNA experiments. You hear that, and it's like, well, if there's, so, I mean, look at we're primitive little hairless apes running around. Like, look at the leaps we've been in DNA in the last 30, 40 years. These things are interstellar traveling. It wouldn't take a millions of years of evolution to, you know, do. It would be a lot quicker. I think. I think. I don't think that that doesn't make sense to me now. Like the whole DNA thing that that makes no sense to me. I mean, I I, I can't figure it out. Like how it ties into like biblical things, like ancient prophecies. Uh, you know, all there's so many angles to it. Like I. I who knows? I think we're going to find out more and more. But the government, I don't think, the, uh, from what I, what I gather, the government doesn't really know either. No one knows. I wonder if, uh, if they don't really know, I wonder if it's something that they are earnestly trying to seek answers to or they're playing more defense where they're just trying to prevent other people from finding answers. You know what I mean? Because like, if you get to a certain point where you you feel like you've exhausted everything and you have no clue on it. Do you switch to the point where now you put things out as disinformation to lead others, organizations, countries astray from finding out the answers because you oh, don't absolutely. have a clue? You know, <laughs> that's part of it. Yeah, I mean, the Russians. It's like, you know, the, the Russians. They they thought we had technology they didn't have, and vice versa, and whatever. You know, like. Um, that I'm sure there's all kinds of disinformation. That's why it's it's just tough. Like, why are they releasing this now? You know, why they? I mean, because they can. Uh, did you ever watch the X Files? Yeah. In real life, the the smoking man is based on two real people that were combined character. Mm. And I'm good friends with the one guy who's that was his father. He wow. was. Um, he ran the division of. Um, what was it? The UFO people all know is like. Uh, 
is it C G and G or E G and G? They were they were the they were the contractors that run uh uh Area 51 and the uh, Liz, Bob Lazar, whatever that was, S four or something like that. Yeah. Um like that that was that wasn't run by the Air Force. That was all that was all that's all Black Ops contract stuff. And his dad, his dad was that guy like that was involved in all that stuff. And he's he's told me all kinds of crazy stuff. He's like, oh, we absolutely have you know, crap what Bob Lazar says is totally true. Like some of these things they found excavating, like they think the thing might be a million years old, judging by the geology around it. I mean, like ancient, ancient, ancient. Like they said, um wow. They said they're not perfect. They're like they crash, like they there's competing they think there's comp- like uh, they might shoot each other down like different uh species or whatever they are or whatever you define them as like they have uh fought each other my my grandpa was really high ranking in the fbi when he retired really high ranking and he did not like me looking into the bigfoot thing and ufo thing because i wasn't really into ufos i was i was always i still am in the bigfoot like like i don't give a shit about ghosts i mean i've seen them <laughs> i know they're real but I, I could care less um i think i'm really interested in ufos but there's nothing i can nothing i can solve like i got i got to experience bigfoot and like you know bring back some like real evidence or something but UFO is just beyond my scope. I, I, I'm into it. Like there's something in the news about it all or whatever. Like there's, uh, I'm buddies with the guy, James Fox that made those movies. He turned me on to some stuff and told me some stuff. When I met those guys at Dave Paul Eddie's and Dennis Fuller's conference, the new fun guys, like spent a weekend with them, you know, had dinner and lunch with them and stuff like that. And I had a table, like our merch tables were next to each other. So those guys blew me away with how much information we actually have on UFOs. Like I was, I didn't know we had all that, all that information. And, but still, they don't know what they are. But my grandpa said what he told me was that um, in the and when the crash is down in um, in Roswell in '47, was that we were testing a new radar system down in the southwest down there. And it was this crazy like they could, they couldn't use it. That when they turned it on, it fried all the radios and um, transmitters, and uh, they said when they flipped it on that. It was a new type of radar. The second it turned on, it picked up those two uh, crafts, and one crashed in Mexico, one crashed in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. They said that um, that that when they turned that thing on, but it was so disruptive of all to all electronics, like it fried everything around it that they never used, turned it on again. But he said that's what he heard brought down the UFOs. That he said, but all that stuff's crazy. Don't you mess around with it? It'll mess with your mind. Don't don't go mess with that. There's you're not going to find any answers and. And everyone that's in that stuff is crazy. Don't get don't get linked up with all those crazies. That's what he <laughs> told me. I'm gonna have a Bigfoot TV show. <laughs> I mean, Should you get more UFO information. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I I'm just. Uh, I, I think it's funny how our lives uh, t- take twists and turns. I'm sure he never would have thought that you would wind up on TV doing Bigfoot and talking on a podcast about your UFO encounters. You know. Yeah. It's wild. Uh, so we, we were we were just talking a little bit here about, um, or you mentioned something about. Uh, I forget how you phrase it, but it, it it just it made this pop in my head uh, with what you said. Moneymaker is announcing at the uh, conference this weekend. Uh, do you think that there there's room for the opportunity? for nefariousness when it comes to that do you think that they that they there there could be uh alternative uh, ulterior ulterior uh, i can't even think of the word i'm looking for uh ulterior yeah motives to uh the whole thing and it's and they you know that it's like here's half truths we're not gonna give it all to you kind of thing so uh, do you think that they, there's room for them to maybe basically turn it into a psyop? Um, I don't think this is. It, I mean, who knows? It, it could be, but I doubt it. I mean, I, I think you know. Uh, I was so shocked, like with the. I think because the Tic Tac videos and that stuff was so like just not high quality. It was so mm-hmm. you know just a little dot thing, but it's it, but with the just with the disclosure from like you know the New York Times article in 2017 and everything since then. Um, you know, I thought it had, it didn't make that much of an impact at all. It was just like, ho hum, like people just, oh, oh, okay. And just went back to their normal lives. You know, it's like, it didn't, I don't know. It's, it's weird, but <clears throat> they, they, they said, well, they're afraid of it disturbing the economy. Like the UFO, they could just, you know, like 
cause the powers that be to lose their power, that people think, oh, you guys aren't in charge anymore, these things are in charge. But I think Bigfoot disclosure would have much bigger impact on the U.S. economy and psyche than if the government admits they're real. I think it'd be way bigger deal. Like Cliff says, no, that no one will care. I said, I disagree wholeheartedly. I think it'd have a huge impact. Besides the extraction industry, natural resources extraction, like logging and mining, I think um, what the biggest impact would be would be on the outdoor, you know, retail, retail markets, you know, like camping and hiking and backpacking and all the, all the towns and mm. counties and that, you know, businesses that live off people going to the outdoors and also rural residents, all the people that have moved in, like all the people that have moved out of the suburbs and like, you know, places on the edge of the woods, like they're like, you know, they, you know, like, you know, some guy comes home and tells his wife, you know, did you hear that news today? Like, you know, Bigfoot, really, she's like, I'm not having my kids exposed to these Bigfoots. We're moving back to town. You know what I mean? Like it could cause like a disruption in the real estate markets for sure. Like all those, there's going to be a lot of people that are like, those things are real. Like they, they, they will not want to live out there. Mm. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, um, just uh, if, to camp, there's monsters walking around. Exactly. I mean, the, there's a sense of um, security when it comes to the idea of UFOs existing, the government saying UFOs exist because they're up there, we're down here. And as far as we know, it hasn't turned into the movie Signs yet, other than Vegas recently. And But, uh, it, but when you say Bigfoot's real... It, people, what people are going to hear is, so you're telling me there's a monster in the woods. Yes, there's this giant creature walking around the woods on stealth mode where more than likely you're not even going to know it's there unless it wants you to know. Like, that's terrifying for people. Absolutely. Well, so you see all the drone footage, all the drone footage from Southern California and Australia and all the great white sharks swimming amongst the swimmers and surfers, like, and no one knows and they're, five feet from these great white sharks they mm. never know it Ugh. same thing oh my gosh i can't imagine i can't imagine that would be terrifying have you ever been that oh, close dude. to a great white dude you want to hear uh, i've got a few good i've seen guys get attacked right next like right in the what water. Like, i've been right yeah i've seen guys get attacked oh my god yeah, we used to serve we used to serve some uh Dude, the biggest day I ever paddled out, I used to be pretty, like, you know, surfing. I wasn't great or nothing. I wasn't a pro, but I was, I was into surfing big waves. And the biggest day I ever tried to paddle out was at Patrick's Point, that point break that sticks out in the ocean. I was talking about sticks out in the, sticks out in the ocean where I saw the UFOs that flew over our heads right there. Um, this guy, Greg Golson, is like biggest big wave guy guy. He was the only guy that made it out. These other big wave guys that are like legends. They, they couldn't even get off the shore. It was so gnarly big. I jumped out and I punched out. I was riding my 10 6 gun. I was paddling. I was in really good shape. You know, I surfed a lot and I was a commercial fisherman. I was in, you know, wintertime. So I was, I was, I was ready for it. And I paddled out. And as I was paddling out, it was, it was literally the biggest sets for like 50, 60 foot on the face. Like, and I think a couple of the biggest ones were maybe 70 way out. Like they were breaking out a couple of miles out at sea and then they were coming in, hitting the point and just, we were, we were, we laid, I know how deep it was. It's like 90 feet out there because we laid, lay, we lay crab pots out there. And dude, I was duck diving through like just mountains, just starting to pitch. And I was like barely punching through the, getting out the backside, like not getting sucked over. And you know, you could, you could really drown in that stuff. There's no help. There's no one around. And as I'm piling out, I, it took me about 45 minutes to get through all the soup lines and, you know, battle my way out there. And, and I was sprint paddling the whole time. I was exhausted. I got I got to really deep water. I knew I was in about a hundred. I was in about twenty fathoms right there. It's about. I know. It's, I, I, knew, I, knew, I knew right where I was. I was in about twenty fathoms, which is like one hundred and twenty feet. And I was just resting, like just going, ha, ha, like just panting, like just totally, like just noodle arm practically. And I, and I was pretty nervous. I was like, how am I going to get back in? Like, there's, I'm going to get killed just trying to get in. Like, it's so gnarly out here. Like I was, I was way out of my, like, I, there was no way I could have rubbed it. I couldn't ride those waves. It, Greg caught one. He caught one and I'm out in the channel way out. Like, I'm three quarters of a mile off the point and he's riding this mod, like 50 foot plus wave. Just, and I looked at it, I could see his face and he's just, this guy's giant dinosaur balls. And he looked nervous, dude. He was just, he wasn't car. He wasn't, he was just survival going straight. It was kind of, it was kind of bumpy. It was pretty bumpy. And he was just, you're flying by and like 
I see him just keep going and going. He never kicks out. He just rode it all the way to the beach. Like, you know, he's like a good three quarters of a mile inside of me. And then I'm out there alone. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. And, it, and a, obviously a huge storm had come through. That's what brewed up that swell. So this, the storm had come through and just caused all this flooding. So there was tons, like there was like dead sheep floating out in the water because the Klamath River flushes all this stuff out. And the floods, when it rains that hard, it'll flood and wash out like stumps and old logs along the riverbanks. So like you get big redwood stumps and logs floating out there. It's pretty dangerous, really. And um, so I'm sitting there and also in the water, uh, is, you can't, you, is, it's less than six inches. It's like literally less than six inches of visibility in the water. And the water just starts churning underneath me. And I'm like, Oh shit. I was like, it's gotta be a stump or a log. And the water just starts boiling up underneath me and boom, like the, by the tail of my board gets nudged pretty hard and lifts out of the water, probably like six, eight inches, something like that. And I get kind of get pitched forward on my board a little bit and I grab my rails and I curl my feet up, bring my legs up in the air. And I, I got up, I put my hands and knees right there. So I was making this cause they bite the head of the tail. Like they usually go for the tail of the sea line, like a big white will go for the head maybe. They almost always go for the tail. Like they come up, bite it in the tail area, get it to bleed, like give it like a brutal bite and then swim away. Maybe come back and hit it again and then let it bleed out and die with their usual MO. So, or sometimes they'll just come in and just rag, like latch on and just rag all and tear the seal in half. I've seen that too. So it starts churning. I'm like, that's just a bump. It's just a stump. It's just a stump. And then the next thing I know, because like a couple of my roommates have been attacked and like they all say the same thing. Like I've, I've known 15 guys have been bit over the years and they all say it feels like it's the most pressure you ever felt on your leg. Just this steel bear trap clamp, just clamp. Like you don't really feel pain at first. It's just super and, and craziest pressure you've ever felt just crushing you. And all of a sudden my leg slams back on my deck of my board. I'm, I'm out at sea with this biggest swells I've ever been in, like giant, giant surf. Shit, I was already scared. I mean, I was scared already. And all of a sudden, my leg, and all of a sudden, I'm going backwards. And the tail of my board's going underwater. And I'm, I grab my board. I, and I don't know if you know about fiberglass, but I had a double six top and bottom S cloth, six ounce fiberglass. So it's it's pretty thick. Then I had a deck patch on there because it's it a big, heavy, big wave board. So I had six ounce, I had three six ounce layers on the deck, then double six on the bottom. And I, put my like i grabbed it so hard i put my fingers through like i did it like in into the fiberglass my fingers went in like made impressions pretty deep i just held on and i'm getting it's trying to pull me off the back of the board and, I, and i'm going backwards and there's water going over my starting to go over my head i'm starting to go under more and more and i'm just like oh my god and, I, and all my friends are the same thing if you're if you ever get attacked close your eyes because the worst thing about it being attacked is the nightmares you always see the thing its mouth wrapped around you and you getting eaten alive. I mean, all my buddies live, but Jeez. They, they, they all report the same thing. So I was like, oh man. So I had my eyes closed. I clapped my eyes shut. I said, if, uh, when it lets go, I'm just going to paddle straight into the whitewash and just get washed. And if I die, I die, whatever. But I'm not going to get eaten alive. So I'm getting dragged backwards. And then all of a sudden my leg comes off the board and, I, and I'm going sideways. My board starting to kind of, um, but I'm holding it trying to hold it on i'm holding onto it and not letting it like t-bone on me like you know like like i didn't want i didn't want to let go because i didn't want to like let it uh i did not want to let go of my board so i was just clamped clamped on it with a death grip then i feel all the pressure on my ankle then i realize it's not i'm not bit it's something's wrapped around my leash and i had this uh decline they're, they're a surf product company they they made me a custom um, 18 foot. They'd make these custom 18 foot leashes. They used to hook me up with these big wave leashes because you need a real big, heavy. They're really thick and long. And mine, mine was so stretched out from being, you know, getting ragdolled so many times, getting caught inside or pitched, not making a drop, whatever. But we had just measured my leash like a week before, and it was 27 and a half feet long. It was re- the longest leash anyone had ever seen, and uh, it was it was ridiculous, but it, it worked. It all it held up. So my leash was hanging way down in the water. And so I open my eyes. I'm going. I'm I'm getting towed under. Something's hooked on my. Something's hooked on. I'm hooked on something. I was thinking, like, well, it could be. It, it, maybe it's a whale. And I was thinking shark. But and I open my eyes. As soon as I open my eyes, I turn my head to look. I just see coming down in the air this giant white shark tail, just in the air, coming down and just hits the water like a foot in front of my face, and just or maybe two foot in front of my face, and just hit me so hard it blew my eyelids all the way up, all of them. 
blasted my eyeballs, shot water up through my sinuses in back in, in the back of my throat and made my head go and, and snapped my head back. The, it was like a fire hose in my face, a salt water. And it did that twice. And then it, there was this huge sp- roiling giant splashing. And then my leash popped loose and I shot up it, it, my board was the tail. Of my board was underwater. It came bouncing back up and I just screamed. My buddy was, uh, this guy was on the cliff. There was a couple guys on the cliff watching. They're watching the waves break out off the, they weren't even looking at me because I was just sitting out there resting. I wasn't, I wasn't surfing. I was just sitting there trying to get the nerve to go paddle into one of those and try to get in. And, um, I screamed, I just go screamed F words. loud. I just go, ah, like just, just so loud. They heard it over the roar of the ocean, like a mile away. They looked out, they saw a huge splashing boil. They didn't, they didn't see They couldn't really see it. They just saw a huge splashing boil. And then me just paddling straight side, like not, not to catch, I was just probably for the white water just to get out of there. That was a whole other story. I almost died coming in. But um, so what happened was, I think it, what it happened is when it came, it bumped me, it bumped me three times because the last time it bumped me, it bumped me like a foot in the air. And I was like, that's when I had my eyes shut. I was just going, please don't, don't, don't bite me, don't bite me. And then, then my leg got slammed and then I was getting dragged backwards. And then all of a sudden I'm pop free. It, it only lasted like the whole dragging incident was probably five seconds, six, seven seconds. It wasn't more than probably seven seconds. And then the, I think what happened was with sharks, when they get hooked on, when they get snagged, that's why they get caught in those shark nets. As soon as they get snagged or hooked on rope or anything or whatever it is, they go into like a, a like a alligator, like a death, like they, go into, they start rolling and thrashing to break free. And that they, what I think what happened was, I think it, it must have bumped me, hooked its pectoral fin, swam back down. It was my leash was wrapped on its pectoral fin. It realized what was going on and it slapped and spun because they, they, they saw like a, like a, explosion like it was spinning like it spun around a couple times and um judging by how long my leash was and where its pectoral thing would have been it had to be and this it's been on shark week the biggest great white sharks in the world have been seen where this is right along the coastline where they're seen right up number it, it was it was at least a 17 footer i mean it was the tail was giant it was huge it just and uh i think what happened was it spun and luckily for me it spun that way so that my leash popped off but if it would have spun the other way, spun into the leash, it would have just wrapped me and my board up, like you know, like reel us up like a fishing reel. It just would have, I would have got me and my board would have just got sucked up, wrapped around it, and it would have dove down, and just drowned me. No one would ever see me again. Jeez, do you? Yeah. So like that day that that happened, you you get to shore. I'm assuming you would call it a day, right? Like you don't go back out. Oh, dude. It was, I almost died coming down the cliffs. I, and then I got washed up onto the beach. Like coming in, it was so crazy, dude. Like I got shoved up on the, I got, they call it the boneyard graveyard. I got washed through that, but the, wa- the white water was so thick, so big. And it was kind of a high tide. If people know about swells, it was, it was tw- uh, 27 feet at 20 seconds. If you know anything about ocean, ocean swells. But, and you got to double the, the 27 foot, you got to double and then add on for the sets even bigger. So it was, you know, it was 50, 60 foot, and then the sets were probably 70, 75 face. It was, it was pretty, and I got, when I got washed up, I washed up on the beach, like it's about a, the trail comes down and, and then the trail ends, but to get the last part, it's uh, logs, like wired together with cables, like each step is a five foot section of log, like about an 18 inch log, five foot long. Every like two feet, there's one cable together, making like a ladder down, like not ladders, but just stairs down the beach. I got washed up past that into the brush. Me and my boy, were, and the, when the white water went back, it receded. I was like six feet in the air in the branches with my board and leash all wrapped up in this bushy tree thing. And then I had to, you know, wiggle out of that, get my board and leash and run up the trail to get it. Um, it was, it was, it was big. I was washing across the whole thing, going up into the creek, into the canyon. It was, it was giant. It was the biggest I ever saw. It. I mean, I, I don't know how. Somebody that goes through something like that decides to go back on the waves ever again. Like, why? It didn't bite me. Huh? It could have. It could have bit me. It didn't bite me. It just it got snagged on me. It was just like an accident. Didn't didn't attack me or nothing. Ah, dude, I don't know. Uh, your friends. You said you had like fifteen friends that have been bit. Did, did they? Did any of them ever quit 
surfing because of the bite or did they all be like no man we're going to continue to do this uh, they, crazy stuff they, they slowed down but they all still surf well no one guy did die jimmy jimmy got killed he got he, but he was uh diving he was urchin diving that you're way worse diving like did i i i seen a shark that was bigger than that you ever see deep blue on shark week that giant biggest one they were filming 20 feet long yeah feet long five thousand pounds we had one that was called charlie shark up here that was bigger than that why yeah that's swim up with me diving if you look at the stats dude divers if you're in 50 feet deep or wa- if you're in water more than 50 feet deep and you get attacked by a great white or a mako in deep water offshore it's a 100 percent fatality rate because they get so much speed because when they come up from below when they're in deep water they get so much speed when they hit you it, and their teeth are so sharp that just they just you're going to bleed to death like it's they usually finish you off like with multiple bites at that point so, but I had, I was diving off Shelter Cove. I was, before work, I'd be at work at 6 a.m. So it was, it was late June, whatever. And it was right before July because they closed the abalone season for July. And back then you could get four abs. So I was, I could jump out and literally swim out less than five minutes, get my four abs, swim back in, change up, be at work before 6 a.m. So um, I jumped out there to dive. It was, you know, still kind of, it's pretty dark and murky underwater and I could barely see it, but I knew where the abs were. This one, we call it the wall. You'd go out, off the wall. You had to swim out through like a little canyon and go offshore a little ways and then dive down. It was about, I don't know, like 15, 25 feet deep around there, 30 feet. So I dove down. I was, and there was this huge dinner plate ab in the back of this crack. And I'm working on it. I already had two in my one arm and I'm, my left arm, my right arm, I had my abalone bar. And I always kept a dive knife strapped to my arm. I never put on, people put on their, you're supposed to put on your calf or on your waist or whatever. But I was like, that's where you get bit. I always kept it on my arm because I had to pull it out. I could stab with it. But I remember just all the hair on my neck going up. It gets darker. All the little fish that hang out around you, like waiting for you to like, because uh, when you pry off the abalone, a lot of times like the little particles break off at little chunks. They come in and, you know, scoop it up. All the little fish just disappeared. This shadow came like, in this gnarliest just feeling of doom just overpowered and i, I i'm like oh my god there's a shark right there and it was pretty big that day I remember, I remember this too i i remember numbers pretty good it was nine feet at 14 seconds which is kind of gnarly to dive on the reef out there at that size swell it's a pretty big swell you know it's like 15 foot face sets and um so you have to you have to be careful when you time it going in and out and when coming to the surface and this and that so i'm, I'm right there um you know, and, and there's waves breaking, whatever, like the water's surging or it's surging pretty good. There's low visibility. And I slowly turn around. I had my ab iron pointed out like, like a weapon as I turned and I dropped the two abalones and I just see this tail, dude, it looked uh, about as tall as me and going into the murk. Like I see just, just as it, just as it disappeared, as I looked over, I mean, it's, it's just right in front of me and up a little bit. Like the, I see the top of the dorsal fin coming down to the thick body and then the pectoral fins like when they're when they're agitated they put their fins down more usually they kind of point them down more and like the top of that dorsal fin to the bottom of those pectoral fins this thing we've seen we've seen it dude it's 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 a, it's a solid 25 footer it's it's giant it's, it's 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 unbelievably it's it's like a sea monster and i just see it melt into the into the depths and it kind of looked like in my you know they swim side to side i thought in my imagination it was making a turn like to come back towards me because they usually they don't just attack they usually swim by you a few times before they attack but you just don't see them and uh so i was like shit so i, I was holding my breath and i was almost out of air when this happened i'd probably been down for about 90 seconds at that point when i saw it and i i could sit down a couple minutes no problem when you're when you get nervous when you see something like that because you got to stay calm and keep your heart rate low my heart just started beating like 200 beats a minute i, my, I could feel my air going away fast and I was waiting and waiting. I just was just about to suck water. I shot to the surface and I turned my back to the ocean. I was like, I don't want to see it coming. So I turned my back. I was swimming just before I got to the surface. Wham! I got slammed from the back. Just smashed face first into the broke my mask. Um, I actually chipped a tooth and got a fat lip a little bit, a little bit of a black eye. And <laughs> I, I had all full disclosure, I had a little bit of a little bit of doo doo came out in my wetsuit. Like I cropped a little chunky <laughs> crap came out. Like I just let I just let loose, dude. And then I, I 
Ooh. what happened was I'd swam, I swam. I didn't. I didn't pay attention to the surf. I swam right up into a wave breaking on the rock on the reef. I just got slammed face first into the rock breaking waves, just right on my head. Slamming into the rocks like dazed me. I wasn't knocked out or nothing, but I was definitely seeing stars. And I climbed up and then I scrambled up there. There's like urchins. I got like urchin spines in me and stuff like sea urchin. They're, they're pretty gnarly. So I'd be getting cut up by you know the the barnacles and then the urchins. So I'm getting I got a few spines in me in my knee and I, I climb up on this rock and like I'm getting pounded. The, here comes another way I get blasted and I had to swim through this channel. And I had, bar- I had borrowed my buddy's weight belt. He goes, if you, if you don't bring my weight belt back, you'll be a hundred bucks. I said, no problem. No, yeah, no worries. I just threw that weight belt off, jumped in the, and then I waited a couple of ways while I was getting knocked off and I was getting knocked around up there. And so I just jumped in and swam for it, swam across that where people have seen him in this channel, like this can- little canyon, offshore canyon. Like they've been seen in there grabbing seals and stuff. And I swam through that, just expecting to get bit in half the whole way. And I swam out, got out. There's no one around. You know, there's no one up there on the on the cliff, and I just got out of the water. So I had this like scary kind of like, and I just had to go straight to work. That's crazy. Yeah, that's wild, man. Uh, that I'll tell you. Um, I think you've lived a life that has. I mean, you, your your life is like ten lives of what I've lived. It's incredible. Like you, like you, you've. I mean, from the the near death shark attack experiences to uh, Bigfoot finding Bigfoot to UFOs shooting, it's like an intergalactic war happening right before your eyes. I mean, it, it's crazy, man. Like, I, I, uh, I don't know. I'm impressed by your life. I, I, didn't, see, I didn't see any intergalactic war. My my grandpa told me that that's what he had heard. Oh, it was your grandfather. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, he told me that. that's what he heard when he was in the FBI. But he he said he, he wasn't sure he believed. He didn't necessarily believe it. That's all he heard. But he he said the whole UFO thing was for crazy people. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're all a little crazy, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but not uh, me. how would you say? <laughs> not me. No, not you. Of course not. <laughs> uh, no, I I I think that uh, it, it's been a wild ride, man. I'm excited to see. So do you think that when you kind of go out, when you go out in the woods now, do you still go out with the same purpose of trying to find uh, evidence and and Bigfoot? Or are you kind of going out there on a more Zen mode of just being in nature and just being part of the environment? Uh, Yeah, mostly just cruise, but you know, I I bring a recording therm. I don't always bring like I didn't have a therm for quite a while. The ones I had crapped out and, you know, and, I just just didn't have one for for a couple you know a couple of years. I'd go out with people that had them, but I didn't have them. But I just still go out. I, yeah, I just go out like you know had some experiences, nothing crazy or anything. Um, doing doing it like that, I never had a, a setting just doing that. But I've had them come around a few times. You know, uh, actually, the most I've had them coming around me the last several years has just been not particularly. I'm just out there, you know. Cru- I mean, I'm in, I'm the areas where they are. But I'm not out there specifically for that. I'm just out there to be out there. Yeah. And if they come around, that's great. You know, I mean, I kind of, I mean, I'd love to get like thermal, some thermal footage or, you know, like some, so, so I'd like to get something solid, you know, just to, to contribute like to the knowledge base and little redemption maybe for people, that, the naysayers. But I, I was convinced it was going to be solved in my lifetime. But now, like, uh, the university's jump, jumping in and uh, Meldrum's working with a lot of scientists behind the scenes, Jeff Meldrum. I mean, he's, there's a lot of really qualified, highly credentialed people that are, you know, that have really been jumping on board, but they're still staying in the background. But I mean, he's got a dozen PhDs on the real and inquiry board, uh, board director over there, like the panel, whatever that oversees the whole thing. Um, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of people getting into it. That's why, like we're doing Bigfoot and Beyond. Like we were, we had a couple of dog man people on and stuff. But at this point, because Cliff's pretty respected in that field, like by the scientific community, even though he's like a lay person, mm-hmm. citizen scientist. With but Meldrum says he goes, he goes, I have PhD students that don't have Cliff's breadth of knowledge of the subject at not even close to Cliff. He said Cliff's definitely PhD level in this at that one aspect of things, you know. Yeah. But um, so we're kind of backing up. Like I told Cliff, I said, all right, like. 
him talking about UFOs and spirits and portals and demons and dogmen and Bigfoots and you know it's not it's not doing the subject any it's not going to help. I, I want real result. I don't. I want science. I want science to get in on it. I want the credential people with the with the equipment and the funding and the time and the resources necessary to get some solid answers, which I think is there, especially starting with the DNA. Um, I, I want to. So I told Clint, I said, all right, I, I, I won't be trying to bring on too many of the woo aspect. Like, uh, we'll leave that to Tony. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to say, leave it to me, but I'll fully expect not to get an invite anytime soon. Because <laughs> I can't. But, I mean, but, if the, but I think that if once we establish this part, I think if the research, you know, these guys are out in the field with these things for the next 10 years, you know, they go, oh, God, we got DNA. They're, 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 they have the funding to sequence genomes now. That was, that was the big hold up they got. And the, the, um, that air DNA, DNA just through the air, like the air air filters, they can take the air filter, like they can run a, a big air filter wherever, anywhere. Like they're all over the world. Like there's air filters everywhere. And you can sample the DNA in the air, what's breathing in the air out there through those filters. Like it, wow. hundreds of different species identified off one filter. That's like wild. There, there's, yeah, there's all kinds of angles we're looking at it now, like the eDNA. Um, I mean, there's, 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 and, the the money is now Belgium's got some um, some people with uh, backing that are you know willing to throw because like the Ketchum study like I know people get mad like Dave Pilates I love the guy and Scott Carpenter's like the nicest guy in the world but she did not prove what she said she she did I mean she probably she does have real D uh, but her study the way she did it and the, the totality of it she did not prove what she claims she proved she just did not. I'd read Dr. Haskell Hart's books, the best thing written on it. He breaks the whole thing down and explains it. She could be right on some things. And my thing is if the, I, I, what we call paranormal now, if we get the researchers out there and like, you know, they start seeing, because the or, a lot of people see the orbs and when you start seeing the orbs around Bigfoot activity. I don't know if they're, I don't know that they're necessarily always correlated or if they are at all, but I think, I think they are at some, some levels sometimes. Um, I think, the woo factor will become from paranormal to pre-normal to normal. Mm. And, and, but they're not going to get into it. If we're talking about portals and dogmen, they're, they're the people with the money and the resources and the education and the backing and all that, they're not coming aboard really. Mm. But if you focus on just the, I know, I know big foots are 3d at least some of the time. And that's what I, that's what I've always been focused on. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, and listen, if, if uh, through all these efforts, we make some real headway on the topic, uh, I think that'd be a win for everybody. It, it, the, the, what you'll find, though, is the, the true colors of people, when that starts happening and you start making headway, there's going to be people, I bet, I'm willing to bet there's going to be people that aren't happy with the results, so they'll, they'll try to poke holes in it and try to find reasons why it's not legitimate because... Well, that's science, but if it's real, it's real. They can prove it scientifically, then they can try to poke holes and they can have their opinions. But if you got sequenced genomes repeatable from different samples, well, there you go. I mean... Yeah. You, and unfortunately, Melba, Melba's study didn't prove, didn't prove that. I mean, some, I mean she... It's uh, it, the I, I can say read Haskell Hart's book, Doctor Haskell Hart, his DNA uh, project. He he goes through the whole thing, explains the whole thing, and she very well could she's she's probably right about some of this stuff, but she just didn't prove it scientifically. But as as far as Bigfoot and the paranormal and normal and biological, you know, and multidimensional and all that, I can't stress enough. Matt Pruitt is one of the smartest guys I've ever met. His book, The uh, Sasquatch. Um, Oh, what? Jesus, I just forgot. The, pheno uh, the, the, phenomenal the phenomenal phenomenon Sasquatch. The phenomenal Sasquatch. Yeah, by Matt Pruitt. Read that book. Meldrum said it's if you if you even Meldrum said this, and he has his own book, Legend Meets Science. He's making Legend Meets Science too right now. He's writing it, and the documentary is getting made with Doug from Monster Quest, Doug Highcheck. But um, anyways, he just said he goes, if you can get people to read one book on Bigfoot, this is absolutely the one. It just came out like two weeks ago. I'm almost done with it. It's it's really good. It breaks down all the different angles and uh, you know mythos and legends and scientific data and um, he lays the whole thing out. It's it's a great book and it uh, it's if you're gonna read one book on Bigfoot, that's the one to mm. start with. 
And yeah. If, if you're out there enough, you're going to probably have this. And if the, if the woo factor is really real and it is connected to Bigfoot or, you know, it, it Bigfoot generated or whatever, that'll, that'll come out in the wash eventually. Sure. It might take a little, take a little longer, but I mean, I, I mean, I've had a couple of my, my weird things and I know, I, and dude, I know scientists in the field that have had weird things that they will not talk about publicly that they said, yeah, like, especially orbs, but also like, kind of like a demon thing they encountered one time, you know, and they just won't discuss it on, you know, and uh, they'll say it in confidence, strict confidentiality, but th- not a lot of them, but a couple of them, you know, it is, they're like, they, they're, it does no good for me to talk about it. It's just going to make me look in the subject look bad. So they just, they said, until, they, until, until we got to establish that they're a real biological, biologically based, real entity, like, you know, living, breathing thing out there. They said, then you can start going to those other areas. Once you establish that part, but starting off on the woo side is not going to get us too far. Hmm. Yeah. See, it, the, so the, uh, the discipline it would take for somebody like me to be like, well, it's not going to do any good. So I'm not going to talk about it. I'd be like, ah, I well, can't not, do it. <laughs> you can talk. No, it's, it's great that you, that you talk about it. Cause for, you're not, well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, I couldn't be in those shoes because I couldn't contain myself. I'd be like, I got to talk about it. I got it. <laughs> you know? Like, so uh, I... Yeah, you know, I'll bring it up. If it's part of the story, I'll talk about it. But I told I said, I'm going to lay off that, you know, just because like the the, uh, the people looking at the subject matter right now and um, surprise, I mean, I'm not trying to brag. It is not because of me at all, but because of Cliff. A lot of the top scientists listen to our podcast. Wow. Like that, you know, that are behind the scenes or people that are just interested, like they'll contact and they'll say, oh, I heard some, this and that, or, you know, they, you know, something on Bigfoot and beyond. Mm-hmm. And that, that's all Cliff and, and Matt Pruitt. Matt Pruitt's our producer of our show. He's got wrote the book. I mean, they're, they're two of the best minds. They're definitely probably the top two lay, lay minds in the field, you know, for ana- scientific analysis, mm. or, you know, non-qualified, non-PhD type, but just, you know, smart guys that have studied it for 20, 30 years extensively. Yeah. I, um, I'm, I'm looking at Matt's, uh, Twitter page and, um, and, uh, I, I, this is so like out of left field, but, uh, Twitter suggests people that you might like. And the first one here is James Bobo Fay. And you've been doing this so long that you're at is squatcher. Like ain't nobody got the at of squatcher, but you got it because you've been doing it so long. Like you're the first one on Twitter that called yourself squatcher. That's that's pretty wild. Well, what was what, what's my last post? Uh, let me click on it here. Uh, you got forty four point four thousand people following you. Your last post was uh, oh, June twenty sixth. You re you retweeted. Uh, your last post, uh, I don't know. I guess your re- last retweet was June 26th. Are you active on there? I was going to say, if you, there's probably less than, in the last five years, probably less than like five posts. Oh, yeah, dude. Like, uh, the, I don't, I don't, so the third one, the third one down is from October 2022. Yeah. yeah I, don't, I, don't, I don't really get on there. Oh, you, you, you retweeted my boy, Alexander Petikov. That's cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was in that movie. Yeah, yeah. I see, I see you on the on the show art here, um, man. Listen, I think this was a blast talking with you. Um, yeah, Tony, you're the best, dude. I, was, I always love talking to you, dude. I I didn't I I didn't expect to hold on you this long. I I, I was like, I, three, dude, three. You gave people three hours. That's freaking. That's awesome, man. Well, I don't, I don't do too many. I'm, I'm done doing Bigfoot podcasts for the most part. I owe a few people. I'm, I just got nothing new to add, and I'm waiting to see what these scientific results come out. And there's, I'm not bringing any. I don't got anything new, so I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not. But you, you got a whole different kind of. I mean, you got Bigfoot, you got paranormal. So you got you got people that don't really know who I am or heard my stories yet. So I was thinking, like, yeah, that's a new audience. Yeah, at least part of it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think uh, there's a lot of people that tune in because they've heard me on other people's podcasts talking about some weird, funky stuff, and they have no idea about the Bigfoot stuff till they come here. And then I'm like, hey, I got a friend. His name's Wes. He has a show called Sasquatch Chronicles. You probably should check him out. <laughs> you know, if, they haven't heard of Wes. No, like some people haven't. They, 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 that's they, like what back in the day when I first started. Like everybody had heard Wes. Uh, yeah, it, you know, but I guess. 
you know, I'm, I'm getting so diverse in my topics that not everybody's into Bigfoot, I guess. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, like you, Wes helped us. I mean, Wes is such a good, yeah. I mean, Wes helped us so much. I mean, we'd still be, I mean, we'd, we'd be years behind of where we're at now if it wasn't for Wes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's he, such a good dude. Yep. I agree. He's my boy. I've heard you, you, you sung his praises, so I'm not saying anything new, but I, I'm just concurring with everything yep. you've said over the years. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, He's, he's always treated me like a brother. He's always treated me well. And, um, you know, like there's not a whole lot of people that I'll, like, I, I, let's put it this way. There's, there's, uh, I, I've had, um, I've had things come up my, uh, uh, you know, across my path over the years and, and I'll, I'll just put it this way. Uh, there is not a whole lot of people that I'll stick my neck on the line for in this podcast, whatever world we're, we're in this content creator stuff. Wes is one of those guys. Like I'll, I'll I will uh, stick my neck on the line for him. And um, I would probably step in and say some, some things to defend him. If I heard people, people saying certain things about him. Um, oh, dude, very rarely I heard people kind of bad about them, like, you know, old rumors and stuff like that. And I yeah. just go, Dude, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're you couldn't be further from the truth. I've 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 met Wes just once. I met him in person. You know, hung out with him. And the guy is generous with his time, with his knowledge, with his contacts. I mean, he's just he's just a very giving, generous, kind-hearted person. Mm-hmm. And I I uh, I learned that early on. And I him between him. Do you know Sam Tripoli, by the way? No, uh, he has a podcast called Tinfoil Hat Podcast. He's friends with Rogan. I I've know. Heard of it. I know you and Rogan are besties. But um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I it, Sam is very much like that. Where Sam is very generous. Um, he he is willing to help. And uh, between Sam and Wes, I've I, I made a decision that I was going to pay it forward, like those guys goes those guys do. So. Um, I don't, I don't have tons of time to sit down and, you know, I get emails from people saying, you know, asking for almost mentorship when it comes to podcasting. I don't have time for that, but, uh, yeah. when I can, especially if it's in conversation and we're already talking, I like helping people where I can, I like giving people shout outs and, you know, cause I, I just believe that, um, the more the, the, this community has success, the more we all succeed together. Uh, a rising a rising tide raises all ships they say and um and in in a selfish sense i don't want to be the guy that tries closing himself off from everybody else hoarding hoarding my listeners not and trying not to to let my listeners know about any other show because man in, in all honesty you know there's going to be shows that pop up over time that you know triple the size of my show and i'm going to wish that i was friends with them you know, and so right. it, it, it's 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 beneficial for everybody to be kind to one another and just be uh, helpful. And um, yeah. I learned that from those yeah, lucky, two guys. Lucky for me, I, I can't offer I can't really offer anything because Pruitt handles everything. I just talk <laughs> once a week. Well, you show up, you talk, you do your job, and you go home. I mean, that's that's uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm kind of in a similar situation where uh, now my brother is handling the production of the show and all that stuff, and I just kind of. I do my recordings. I I talk and I have the I have I have the fun part of the job now, and uh, yeah. he handles all the audio production and putting the shows together. And he basically puts the final product in a Dropbox, and I uh, I download it and upload it to the service you know providers and all that stuff because I uh, uh, I, I don't quite want to re- you know release that responsibility yet. I want to be able to put you know in the description, type up what I want to say about the episode and things right. like that, but. Um. Yeah, he's been a, a godsend for me. So yeah, um, I'm so I'm so tech tarted. I couldn't do anything you just said. <laughs> I, I can offer. I can. I can offer no advice to people. I'm just like, get yourself a great producer and treat them well. Right. Exactly. Uh, because they're hard to come by. Uh, I. I mine's homegrown. I. I when I started the podcast, he was he was 20 when when I started the podcast and early on i would have him come down and just hang out with me during you know doing live shows and things like that and then then i started integrating him into producing one of the other podcasts we were doing and uh here we are now he moved to tennessee he works for me and he handles 
all that fun. Well, it used to be fun for me. It's not so much fun anymore. That's why I had to get somebody else on it. I mean, it's exhausting. I mean, doing it and putting all the time into the production and, you know, it's it's very time consuming. Just even export, like for instance, this is a three hour and 15 minute recording we're working on here. Like this is going to take probably at least an hour to export. That's an that's a, that's a lot of time to take up trying to watch a computer screen so that you can just move on right. to the next phase of getting right. a show done. You know, so right. it, it's been it's been really really good to have him around. And uh, I told him when I hired him, I said, "Listen, I don't care. I'm not the guy that focuses on how many hours you work. I'm paying you a salary. I'm not paying you by hour." Uh, and I said, if you get your job done in two hours, then it's two hours. I'm good with that. Go live your life. If it takes 16 hours to get the job done though, that's what it takes. <laughs> you know, I said, I don't, I don't really care about how long you work. I just want the job done. So if you can get it done in two hours, cool. Uh, but I also need you to be willing to sacrifice a 16 hour day if you need it. So, uh, he's been oh, awesome. Yeah. That's like, a on the TV shows. We'd, we'd, we'd have long days you'd, and the crew would come back. They literally would have 18, 20 hour days every day. It was like, they had to do all that uploading and hot sheets and charging batteries and coming mm. up with next day schedule. And I was like, God, those guys work so much. And it's, it's a lot of work. Like you'll think that this is like, oh, like the entertainment side of things. It's just so it's, you know, you just talk and whatever, but there's a ton of work behind the scenes, a ton. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, I, I, I burned up your time here. No, you didn't burn my time up, man. I'm good. Uh, but uh, yeah, let me, let me, I'm going to wind the show down, everybody. I appreciate everybody tuning in, hanging out with me and Bobo. Uh, hopefully, hopefully people uh, heard things today that they didn't know about you. Uh, hopefully they, they learned some things. They heard some stories. They're like, dang, I didn't know that. Uh, that was kind of my goal sitting down. I just kind of wanted to open up and start, you know, in one direction and just let it kind of evolve. And I think that's what we did for the last three hours. So, um, thanks everybody for tuning in. And, uh, if you haven't no, if you don't know already, I am dropping our second film, August 19th. That's August 19th, 2023. And it's going to be called the shape of shadows and it's going to be awesome. So be on the lookout for that. You can, you'll be watching it on the website, theshapeofshadows.com. That's where you can purchase it. We are not releasing through Amazon, Tubi, Apple, or any other pro- platform until uh, we release through ourselves first because we have spent a lot of time over on this end building up an audience base. And we feel like Amazon shouldn't be hoarding in on that. So uh, we're going to be doing self-releasing initially, and then we'll move to Amazon, Tubi, Apple, and all that stuff in time. But right now, we're just going to release through the shapeofshadows.com. Uh, soon, you'll be seeing the uh, ability to purchase that film on there. Stay tuned for that. I'll let you guys know more details when I have them. But until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first, it will piss you off. Bye. Maybe I'm forgotten at the bottom where it's hollow.
something that's driving me further I'm looking for eating, but it's on the foot You start in the darkness, it's just premature My tunnels go deeper than Abraham Watch crack up from source from the cherubim Lies on me like wings from a sand